by executive order N 2920 issued on uh, November 18th, 2020, NMUSD board meetings will be closed to the public. The public may watch the meeting by joining the Zoom webinar at https colon forward slash forward slash nmusd dot zoom dot us dot s. Uh, I mean, sorry, us forward slash s forward slash n three eight nine four eight two one eight three seven. Um, habrá interpretación al español a través del mismo enlace de Zoom. Okay, so calling uh, the regular meeting of uh, June 9th, 2020. Um, roll call, please. Ms. Floor. Here. Ms. Yelsey. Here. Ms. Black. Here. Ms. Barto. Here. Ms. Anderson. Ms. Snell? Here. Ms. Matoye? Ms. Matoye? Oh. She's here. Dr. Navarro, superintendent? Absent. Uh, and, and then you call, call Russell Lee Sung, please. Russell Lee Sung? Here. Thank okay. you. Um, uh, Dana, would you read the uh, public comments on closed session agenda items only, please. Um, Mrs. Floor, do we have any comments first? We have no comments. Then we don't need to read it. Perfect. Okay. So we will recess in, uh, not recess, sorry. We will, uh, yeah. Oh, Ms. Anderson is here. Please make note, Rosie, that Aunt Ms. Anderson is here. We Hi. will um, move into closed session. Uh, will there be report out, Dr. Lee Sung, Mr. Lee Sung? Uh, no, not on this item. Okay, great. So we will go into closed session um, for the following items. Number 4A, threat to public services or facilities, government code section uh, 54957A, consultation with agency counsel. Um, and number 4B, public employee discipline slash dismissal slash dis release slash employment pursuant to government code section 54957 and education code section 44954. Okay, so we will log out and go back into closed session. Good evening and welcome to the June 9th, 2020 Board of Education meeting via teleconference. By executive order N29-20 issued on March 18th, 2020, NMUSD board meetings will be closed to the public. The public may watch the meeting by joining the Zoom webinar at https colon forward slash forward slash nmusd dot zoom dot us forward slash s forward slash nine three eight nine four eight two one eight three seven habrá interpretación al español a través del mismo enlace de zoom and i would like to take this moment to introduce um, our interpreter javier zamoreno who has is capably is online and will interpret all of our meetings um, for the public who who need uh, translation. We have a call to order. There are no readouts on closed session. Our next item is adoption of the agenda. Um, item seven. May I have a motion to adopt the agenda? Move to adopt, adopt the agenda. Second. Dana Black. Okay, Mrs. Black moved. Yelsey second. Mrs. Yelsey seconded. A uh, roll call, please. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Barto? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snell? Yes. Ms. Matoya? Yes. Perfect. Um, item adoption of the minutes of 05 and 05 May I have a motion, please? 
Motion to adopt the minutes of 519.20 and 529.20. Yelsey. And a second. second. Uh, Mrs. Yelsey moved. Mrs. Black seconded. Roll call, please. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snell? Yes. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Um, we are now going to community input, um, electronic submissions. I do want to make a couple of, of notes. One is um, that there were several comments uh, posted uh, at our study session, which we could only accept comments on the agendized item, which was the 2020-21 budget. So um, I have held those off, and those are the first ones that we posted. And so, uh, Mrs. Black, would you please read, and then we'll go into the, the, um, the community items. Sure. This is an opportunity <clears throat> for the public to address the board regarding items on the regular meeting agenda via electronically submitted comments. Each um, speaker has three minutes of comment read time. And per board policy 9323, there is a maximum of 20 minutes of comments per topic. With board consent, the president may increase or decrease the time allowed for public comments. Depending on the topic and the number of persons submitting con um, comments, all comments are recorded in full on the uh, meeting video record. Terrific. Okay, so we have a number of comments um, regarding graduation. Um, then we have some comments, uh, just public comments, a couple on use of facilities. Um, so we will begin with uh, Ms. Anderson, please. Yes, um, my first comment is from Cindy Valdez on graduation. She writes, the budget for the upcoming school year has been cut. We should not be spending money on an expensive high-end production of a virtual graduation that the students and parents of Newport Mesa Unified clearly do not want. It is time for the board to overturn their initial decision and let the graduation ceremony be postponed until July when restrictions will likely be lifted. Please follow what other high schools in Orange County and the state have done. Our kids want to be with their classmates in person and will be so appreciative of a second look at this decision. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bartow. This comment is from Sunny Beaker regarding graduation. She writes, we are questioning why so many schools around us are having in-person or drive-up graduations and our district with so much parental support are digging in their heels. We believe the production company will work with us. We don't understand why Modern Day, Tustin USD, Mission Viejo, LaSalle, SAGE, the Air Force, HBUSD, LAHS, San Gabriel USD, and many other schools are finding a way and we are not even considering it. It defies logic. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Black? Yes, community member Wendy Johnson. <clears throat> One last ditch effort to persuade the school district to reconsider. This is an exceptional class that's had to endure a Nazi scandal and other incidents which certainly do not reflect on this great class. In light of businesses, restaurants, and salons opening, seems overly punitive to deny the class of 2020 this age old of passage. We can all remember the thrill of our own graduations and the joy of moving the tassel and throwing our caps at six feet apart. <laughs> Um, please do not, uh, please do the right thing. These kids deserve this after the demise of the rest of their senior milestones and memories. Um, in parentheses, she puts prom, senior trips, and grad night. This is a lifelong memory you are depriving them of. Please reconsider. Parents are most definitely behind this, are willing to even sacrifice our own in-person viewing if you just let them show how respectful and responsible they are. Thank you. Okay, I have the next one from Renee Nettleman. Uh, what is the budget for your pathetic virtual graduation? I heard it was $100,000. Uh, 
With that much money of taxpayer dollars, you would think we would get a say in how you all plan to celebrate our children. You'll be lucky to get half of the students to even watch it. It's a virtual nightmare to the kids who deserve so much better. I smell corruption and I won't stop digging until I get you out uh, off, get out off Doc, Mr. Navarro and your minions. My question is, is it true that Dr. Navarro gets a car allowance? If so, what does this entail? Is it a mileage allowance or a whole car? Thank you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, my public comment is from Carrie Williams Freitas, or Freitas, I'm not sure. I would like to know the amount of money being spent on the virtual graduations, and also is someone within the Newport Mesa Unified School District, Superintendent, Board of Education, has a relationship with someone working for the company they contracted with. I'd also like to know what the competitive bids were for the virtual graduation product. What other companies were interviewed and what were their cost estimates? Thank you. I have the next one, Stephanie Close. I find it interesting that the graduates can social distance inside the Newport Harbor High School Library next week to return textbooks items needed by the district, but they can't social distance outdoors for a graduation. Please explain your rationale apparently behind closed door decision of a virtual graduation. It cannot be merely safety issues, as clearly a social distance in-person graduation would be just as safe for our students as next week's indoor textbook return. And it can be held later at a later date as well to further ensure a healthy environment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is back to Mrs. Anderson. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Mine is from Susie Contra on graduation. I would like to humbly request the board to sincerely look at a normal graduation on Davidson Field instead of a virtual graduation. Governor Newsom has reopened the schools in California. This is doable. Please do not ratify the virtual graduation or if you do have it, please make it so it is virtual for the parents to watch at home while the kids are able to take the walk on the field. I would also humbly ask that any I would also humbly ask that any ego or pride period we set aside so the kids can have a grand celebration and leave the school district with their he their heads held high in a sense have an incredible accomplishment during these trying times hundreds of schools across the nation have done the social distancing 6 feet apart chairs and other six feet apart chairs and other states and other counties and other districts so it is possible please do the right thing and not take away a memorable graduation ceremony they deserve more they need more than just a virtual computer screen for this accomplishment especially now this can be done let them walk thank you uh, miss bartow this is from tammy bradbury Please help my daughter who's graduating from Newport Harbor next month have an in-person graduation. She's my oldest daughter and this semester so much has been taken away from her. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Black? Yes, my community member is Lisa Carley. Um, she writes, enough is enough. These kids have lost a lot. You can make it happen. Be a hero, not a zero. Okay, um, I'm next. I have Christine Negretti. I would like to know if you have given any consideration to the numerous letters, student requests, protests, and media coverage related to another option versus a virtual graduation. Did you ask survey parents or students on if on if a other event was favored? Why are so many other districts coming up with creative ways yet our district has not? Did you cost out a parade or a drive up through option? And what is the cost of this option versus the production for the virtual graduation for six schools? We would like a breakdown of why other options wouldn't work and why the need to make a decision so early. Ms. Matoye. You're on, you're on mute. <laughs> that makes it harder to hear. Um, Susan Totten says, 
We are questioning why the district is not open to discussing a different kind of graduation for our seniors. It seems that other districts nearby are having socially distanced graduations that are safe. We do not understand why this is not possible for Newport Beach. Great, thank Ms. you. Uh, Ms. Yelsey. I have a senior at Newport Harbor High School and I would like my son not to miss out on his graduation, even if we have it in July or August. These seniors have missed so much of their senior year with no activities, no prom, and it is heartbreaking. We still do, do do the distancing at some places like the fairgrounds. Everything is starting to, starting to open up, bars, restaurants. I hear Brea Mall is open. Hair and nail salons will be opening soon. That is not really social distancing. And we still need to wear masks, so can our children. Please think about reconsidering and maybe holding it later, later than June. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Anderson. Um, I have Deborah Fifey. Please let the class of 2020 have something other than a virtual graduation. Other schools have done it. We can find a way to. Let's make this a celebration, not an online event that many won't take part in. Our students, teachers, and we as parents have worked too hard to let this milestone pass without recognition. Everything is opening up. We as a community need this to lift our spirits and give hope for the future. Please, there are ways to make this safe and happy for all. Let's do so. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Bartow? I have Cynthia Blackwell who comments, I continue to be concerned about the method of communication to the parents in NMUSD. As, a, as distance learning has proven, there are households that do not have internet access or they, for whatever reason, don't receive email communications. Parent notifications need to be sent via UP, USPS. Also, it has come to my attention that Mayor Foley has attempted to set up a drive-by graduation or something along those lines at the OC Fairgrounds. What is the status of her attempt? That sounds like the perfect location to have a graduation ceremony during this unusual time. Finally, will there be summer school for our at-risk students? Terrific. Uh, those are the comments that are on the graduation. Uh, uh, Mr. Lee Sung, I will will go on to the rest of them, but I hope that you have taken some notes and that um, we can address uh, the graduation with some comments um, from uh, Dr. Byermeister since he's been ma managing that. So we'll go to our next public comment portion, but then we'll come back to that one before we go on to the other ones. Uh, so uh, Ms. Black, you have Ms. Lease. Um, Wendy Lease, um, under public comments, it is my experience that non-agenda public comments are spoken, now re read from an email at the beginning of the meeting, and that comments on agenda items are given, now read, at the point where agenda item is introduced. Please do not lump all comments sent in through email to be lumped together at the beginning of the meeting. The public hearing on the budget is a separate important agenda item to the public. Secondly, when approving the agenda, I ask you to please move the public hearing on the budget to the beginning of the meeting so that the public can watch the discussion and not have to wait until the end of the meeting. These are our tax dollars and you are spending, that you are spending. By not allowing real-time public comments, you are putting us, the public, at a disadvantage because we have not heard the presentation of the budget. Detailed details matter. My email comments may be, in fact, irrelevant because I wrote them before I heard the presentation. The Zoom webinar allows for public comment function as witnessed by the city of Costa Mesa. It is not rocket science to allow live comments and email comments. CSBA doesn't just encourage public engagement. CSBA says you must engage the public. Only allowing emails written before the meeting is not engaging the public. Thank you for your time, Wendy. And I have the um, one from uh, Mr. John Blue. It's regarding, uh, we respectfully submit our request to have access to Kaiser School Campus, Pacific Point Church, has been meeting at Kaiser Elementary School since September of 2018. Our church is small but mighty with an average attendance of about 40 people. 
we have been fortunate to have an excellent relationship with the school administration and have sought support to support the school with volunteering. We are requesting permission to use outdoor lunch area with access to the bathrooms and electrical on Sundays at 8.30 to 2, uh, 12 p.m. to allow for setup and cleanup. We will guarantee to disinfect any area we use each week. At a minimum, we would appreciate using the parking lot to meet within access of, to bathrooms and electrical. Finally, we need access to the auditorium to remove our equipment as well. We have not been able to access it since the day stay at home orders went into effect. Thank you for considering our request. And let me see. Um, I'm next. That, uh, we have one more. Uh, oh, that's a that's uh, from current planning and decisions on the budget. I'm going to hold that one till we get to the public hearing because it's on on the on the budget itself. Um, so on item 18A. So Lori Smith, if you're in attendance, I'm going to hold that one to to um, and move that. So uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Lee Sung, could you address um, the graduation, please, and then also perhaps Tim can answer. Um, the uh, Kaiser facilities facilities issue. Thank you. All right. Uh, let me first have Dr. Baumeister give an update on the graduations, and then I'll add a few comments uh, in response to some of the uh, uh, public comments this evening. Dr. Baumeister, you want to give an update first? Did you, uh, uh, Mr. Lee Sung, do you want an update of where we are, or kind of like a thumbnail of how we got here? Uh, a little bit of both. Yes. Okay. We started, we started meeting with uh, middle school, high school activities directors and principals back on April 23rd. At that time, we discussed a bunch of different possibilities. We talked about, obviously, the traditional with uh, people in the stands, our normal graduation, but knew that that was probably not going to happen. We also talked about what is known as kind of an Air Force style, where the kids come in to the stadium, they have their social distancing, there's no people in the stands. Um, and uh, have a more of a traditional style. We also talked about a drive-in model, a drive-through model, and virtual model. So we discussed all of those models. We brought those in. We asked the athletic or the activities directors and the principals to go back to talk to their students and their staff, and then come back on the 30th, and we kind of rank where everybody was on those different um, types of graduations. So when they came back, the middle school was all locked in and we also looked at different dates too. Do you want to do it in the traditional time? Do you want to move it back later in summer? So we asked what was their preference on dates as well. Again, go talk to your kids, talk to staff, talk to some influential parents in your community and come back and, and we'll get your choices. But at that meeting on the 30th then, the middle schools decided they wanted to go on their traditional date, June 17th, and they wanted to go with a virtual style uh, graduation. The high schools at that point were in favor of moving graduation back to June 30th if they could have the Air Force style graduation. That's really kind of what they wanted. But again, didn't know if we moved it back to July, if that would even be possible. So uh, the other question we wanted to know is when is kind of the drop dead date that we have to have a decision by? Because the activities directors were concerned because they're the ones that have to plan out the graduations and all the details. And they said it really, especially if we're going to do something that we've never done before, we need at least a month to plan. So we need to know by the middle of May. So on May 1st, we met again with all of the high school principals, middle school principals to talk about it. At that point, they really kind of came to the decision that they didn't want to move it back to the summer. They really wanted to do it more in traditional graduation time because they were afraid if we pushed it back, there would be kids that would be going off to college. There would be kids that were working that there wouldn't be all of the kids that could be involved. The other thing is we wouldn't have staff available in the summer to be able to work the graduation. Um, and also there were you know, staff members that were not comfortable um, with coming in. So um, on, on May 5th, um, one of our principals brought to us a company called Van Wagner, who uh, do virtual uh, the NFL draft, Final Four, Super Bowl, those things. They did uh, graduation for USC. They've done other colleges. And they made a presentation to the principals 
on May 5th, which the principals were very impressed with. So at our next meeting with the activities directors and the principals, we brought out a document that Mr. Lee Sung had given us about what all of the local districts were doing for graduation. So we looked at what all the local districts were doing. Um, we looked at um, what we wanted to do and uh, they came to a decision at that time to go with the Van Wagner virtual graduation. Um, and then again, have another event later on in the summer where they would bring the kids in so they could have that one last time to be together. So they wanted to have kind of a, a more of a traditional um, ceremony, which had to be virtual because of uh, safety and uh, other reasons. But again, they wanted to have an event later in the summer that the kids could help plan where they would all come together and be together later in the summer. So that's kind of how we got to, to where we are with this type of graduation right now. And the schedule for graduations next week? Kirk? The schedule is the middle schools will be on Thursday. Ensign will kick it off at, uh, yeah, Thursday the 17th. Ensign will kick it off at one o'clock, Colonel Lamar at four o'clock, Costa Mesa at six o'clock, and Tewinkle at six o'clock as well. The high schools um, had to go on different days. Um, Monday uh, will be Back Bay at two o'clock and early college at six o'clock. They, they are the only ones that aren't doing live uh, broadcasts uh, because they were, had to be on the same day so they couldn't really do live broadcasts. Uh, Costa Mesa will be Tuesday at six o'clock. Uh, Estancia will be Wednesday at three o'clock. Colonel Del Mar will be Thursday at six o'clock and Newport Harbor will be Friday at six o'clock as well. And actually Estancia and Costa Mesa are the only ones that are actually doing the live broadcast. Both Cornemar and Newport Harbor decided to go with the pre-recorded because they didn't feel comfortable doing a live broadcast. So that's kind of where everybody landed on those. If, if I might add, um, obviously these decisions uh, are not taken lightly. We would all prefer and would love to have an in-person event, uh, but these decisions being made is based on the safety of our students and the spectators and staff. And uh, it, even though there's a lot of questions about the financial part, I know our board wanted to provide the best uh, service uh, for this option. And uh, we, we pursued that. And, but it is about safety. Uh, I know there's some comparisons about kids coming on campus to pick up books. But when we're talking about celebratory events, and there is a strong tendency for people to want to be together. And uh, we're very concerned about, about the safety of our staff and students. So at this point, we are moving forward with the, uh, the plans uh, and also supporting the sites to have their in-person events where students can come together uh, later on in the summer. I think another thing to realize is while we did get a number of emails from people that wanted to do the in-person graduation, there are students that don't feel comfortable coming back. We do have students with respiratory problems that couldn't come back and be a part of that as well. So there are people that, that didn't want to, to, to do that as well. And we did get emails from those people as well. Um, I also want to point out that there was a question about who brought it. Um, I want to compliment Jennifer Fox, who is an assistant principal at Ensign uh, Middle School. She has worked uh, over the summers and is a reserve lifeguard. And she is in fact the individual who brought to us the company um, that you see on the agenda tonight for the middle school. They have done the junior guard uh, uh, promotions for the last couple of years. And so we are very grateful for Jennifer Fox, an employee of our great district, a great uh, assistant principal um, at Ensign, as well as a former teacher at um, Estancia High School. And, and she's we actually uh, looked at, at four different companies and that's the companies that the middle school chose. Great, thank you. Um, also, uh, Ms. Matoyer and I had the opportunity to hear from a couple of the school districts who did in person. And to give you an example, Abreo Olinda, um, they have one high school. They did an in person uh, parade sort of, so to speak, falling in line with the guidelines um, that were put, put out by our uh, Orange County um, Department of Health. 
Um, they had 353 individuals uh, doing the graduation. It took them 12 hours uh, to do the graduation over a three-day period. And our, our largest school is 533, and our smallest school is uh, 287, almost 300 students. And that, it took them three hour, uh, 12 hours to, to complete a graduation. And so I, thought, I thought also that I would let you know what the summer events are that so, so far so far that we have uh, for Back Bay Monte Vista it says they're planning a their senior event on July 14th from 11 to 2 and they'll have photo opportunities capping gown with their principal they'll have food and entertainment and they're all fairly similar Colonel Mar says they're working with their student leaders to determine their in-person event but it'll be July 16th from 11 to 2 It'll be, they'll have a yearbook signing, they'll have cap and gown photo opportunities with their principal as the student's name is called, and then they will have food for the students as well. Costa Mesa High School has a senior luau, and this is something they, they do every year with their kids anyway. Um, it, it, so August 1st, uh, from 6.30 to 10, they'll be doing a luau in the kind of pool and gym area, with cap and gown photo opportunities, yearbook signing, food vendors, I think they said the, uh, the truck, the burger truck will be there uh, and different types of entertainment. Um, Early College is planning their event for August 1st from 10.30 to 1. Uh, cap and gown, photo opportunity, student performances and speeches, followed by entertainment with a DJ, yearbook signing, uh, and food. Estancia High School, uh, Mike said that he is still working with his seniors to, to come up with their plan so they don't have their date or their is working with their seniors on that. Uh, Newport Harbor is July 16th from three to 10, long, long event. Um, and they are doing an in-person event with a yearbook signing, cap and gown photos, food, kind of the same, same type of idea as most of the other schools. So that's what they're planning. Terrific, thank you, Kurt. Um, any further questions, uh, comments, Dr. Uh, Mr. Lee Sung on that? Uh, not on that topic, but Mrs. Flora, I wanted to uh, just point out that there were several comments uh, on item 10. Yes, we're going to, go into that one. The opening. So yes. if you could read those comments before I make my comments. You got it. We're planning on doing that. I just wanted to make sure. Um, uh, Tim, could you address the, the issue of school facilities for outside, outside groups? You're on, you're on mute. Yes. yes, sorry. I was just looking for the thing to click. Um, Yes, I'll, I'll follow up with Mr. Bidnick. I was not aware of uh, this particular group and their request, so we can reach out to them and talk to them about um, the equipment that they have and about our, uh, our policies, and, and then we can get back and follow up with you all. Yeah, I think it would be really incumbent upon us to find out you know, whether, whether we're starting to open up. I know that that's a question from the city of Newport Beach and their uh, Laura Detweiler. Um, at our city liaison meeting is, is they had planned um, several uh, camps and now that things are opening up, I would really like to get some, um, some information and some follow up on what will be allowed and what, whether our facilities, I know we're doing construction on some of them, but we really need to figure out and get, get, get a message out on the use of facilities because I know that there are organizations, just my own Girl Scouts, are, <laughs> they're anxious to get back. Um, and follow file guidelines. So it'd be really nice if we could figure out something so on on those. And we've got lots of lots of churches in, that use our facilities. So Very good. Can we get a date? Thank you for clarifying that. Can we have a date that we could let them know? So yes. First, uh, I will look into the specific request from the specific group and understand a little bit more about that, and follow up with you all about that. And then we will look into the broader picture. Uh, and get back to you with that as well. Can we hope that we could have something by the the June twenty third board meeting? Would that be would that be possible? I think so. Good. Well, okay. Mike, if I so if the schools are open from the state's perspective, that's what we've been waiting on. So for this specific request, if they're outside, I think waiting a few more weeks. Like I think we can give them an answer, yes or no, relatively quickly. Well, they're not, yeah, the only, but they're not the only one, I think, um, Ashley, that we have a lot of churches. We have a church that meets at 
um, at some of our schools. We, Monta Vista Back Bay has a church that has been using their their facility yep. for years, and I, and I, and I don't know. And I think everybody has been can't do it. So I think it's it's incumbent that we have a uniform approach to all of it. So if we could just have some clarification on that. Right. Right. I'm just saying we don't need to wait two whole weeks to get clarification. So the sooner the better. Thank you. Got it. Mrs. Mr. Lee Sung, you had something to yeah, say? Yeah, I just I just wanted to provide some information to the board on, on this topic. Um, as you know, through this pandemic, we've had to put a hold on all user groups uh, use of our facilities. Um, and now that opening up, uh, we have to be equally careful in terms of bringing folks back onto the use of our campus. One thing that employees and individuals who are slowly coming back to work on site are very concerned about is who else has been on campus at the time. So we need to coordinate our reopening of our user groups to make sure that we can properly monitor, clean, uh, and, and make sure that we know who's using what facilities. But we're kind of at that stage now where we need to look at that and prepare and start bringing folks back and uh, step by step back to normalcy. But that is a big uh, concern. Uh, and also, as you mentioned, construction and a very aggressive deep cleaning schedule uh, by our cleaning crew throughout the summer. So there's a lot of considerations in doing that, but we certainly would like to start inching back uh, to normal. Great, thank you. Um, so we're now moving on to item number 10, which is the superintendent's report reopening plan. I mean, we have a number of comments um, going towards that. Uh, again, so this is item number 10. Ms. Yelsey, uh, I believe you have the first one. Yes, it's from Tamara Fairbanks. After participating in session one of the reopening of schools task force, I felt encouraged about our district's direction to school safety. I am glad that NMUSD is mindful of the plan being, being a living plan and that they are putting safety first. I am encouraged that our employees will have proper PPE, sanitizing and safety equipment to protect themselves on the job. Many of our employees are experiencing the same obstacles as the public, taking care of families who are at risk and working from home with their children while faced with the uncertainty of reopening. Ensuring the healthiest work environment so our employees can give their best quality work is critical. The collaboration betters the entire community. Creating accommodation for those at risk, making sure that we can help our students in special education, closing the achievement gap of our EL population, and ensuring that we have quality materials while we work with children are ideals that we hold most dear. I celebrate and commend our employees who in a short time have been trained to new software applications, reached out to students, held Zoom sessions and office hours, copied packets for students, created online web material, and adapted what they do in the classroom to a virtual world. They did this in spite of their professional devices glitching and buff buffering during instruction. Some of these teachers did purchase their own Wi-Fi and devices because they cared so much for their students that they wanted to provide them a quality experience. These employees understand the continued investment needed to ensure the quality of their work. We in turn ask NMUSD to continue collaborative efforts to ensure their safety and well-being for the, for the well-being during our reopening. We ask NMUSD to not only invest in their health, but in improved to tools for quality instruction. We believe there are some areas needing improvement and that ongoing communication and collaboration is imperative. We can all agree that investing in our workers and, and committing to work together is an investment in a larger community. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go back to Lori Smith because hers is current planning and decisions and budget. And so I apologize, but I was reading through it and she had some questions really about reopening. So Ms. Matoye, if you could read hers, I would appreciate it. I'll, and I'll put, her back, put her back in. No problem. Let me just use my flashlight because it's getting dark in the room I'm using. Okay. From Lori Smith, dear members of the board, we are now three months into the COVID pandemic and distance learning. It's June, budget time, and summer plans and reopening are upon us. At this time of greatest need for our students and families, please reassess your leadership and consider the following decisions. 
approve a budget focused on compassion, connect correcting inequities. Do this by adding, yes, adding, professional counselors, community facilitators, and nurses. COVID should not be an excuse for maintaining our deficient status quo in meeting the social emotional needs of our students. We have reserves, use them. Technology support for low income students. Have you made sure all our students have Wi-Fi and Chromebooks? Have you made sure staff has identified these students by checking in with teachers, using facilitators to check on risk, check on at risk students and filling the gaps? What has been done for those hard to reach families? Home visits can be made with masks and social distancing, if not by staff, by use of known community partners and volunteers. Compassion should find you to to drive you to find solutions. Have you created a summer school plan in collaboration with teachers? Is it flexible enough to move from distance learning to the classroom and then communicated to parents? Defund your army of attorneys. You won't need them if you ask our leaders to come out of hiding, start listening to the community of parents and staff and develop relationships. And expensive consultant fees. Our capable current staff knows our students and can fill the need, believe in them, trust them, and their leaders who have direct connections to the classroom. Eliminate district leadership of fear and control that has stifled staff and students from reaching their full potential. Sadly, it has become more unresponsive, untrusting, and insular behind the cover of COVID and Zoom. There has never been a more urgent time for change in the district's leadership culture, for compassion, confident, flexible, and humble leaders who share power by listening and lead by listening, building community relationships, and embracing change. You are, our, you are our elected leaders. You must make the change we need to see. Lori Smith, retired teacher. You're on mute. On mute. It's, uh, Ms. Anderson. You're on mute now. Ms. Anderson? I'm finding the comment. Oh, it's on page uh, six. It's on page six. Okay. This is from Alicia um, Baguette. As a school psychologist and BCBA who has worked with students for 10 years in Orange County, I write with perspective of concern of the social, emotional, and learning implications that we will experience from our current school closures. And I urge you to consider reopening schools in the fall with the scrutiny of the CDC guidelines. It will be a huge mistake to not send our children back to school under anything but normal circumstances. The problem we are currently experiencing not only includes a learning loss, distance learning is not meeting the needs of most students, especially those with inequities due to income or special needs. Restricting social interaction is detrimental to development. Your responsibility to children is beyond teaching academics. Children need to connect with other children in real time and space whether it's for physical activity or structured play, with diverse environments and individuals. Our recent study of Chinese children revealed that restrictions to home and reduction of outdoor activities and social interaction was associated with an increase in children's symptoms of depression and anxiety. Please refer to your legal and ethical codes and professional standards to create a learning environment that nurtures fulfillment in all areas with quality and integrity. I implore you to carefully read the local data that shows that this virus is no more harmful than the influenza virus, yet we have never kept our children out of school for that. And children are known to be transmitters of influenza. We have had much evidence following highly flawed medical models that initiated school closures that allowed districts to safely return to normalcy. A systematic review of 47 publications indicates children with COVID-19 seldom initiated 
the spread of infection with the household. Studies show that even asymptomatic carriers yield no transmission as indicated by nuclei acid tests of traced individuals. While I support the end of the one size fits all factory model of public education and know that various proposals are being considered, adherence to CDC guidelines is harmful. You have a duty to expect and facilitate achievement of expected learning outcomes irrespective of student and family differences. High quality learning opportunities that support all areas are required of education. Great, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bartow. I have Erin Merriman. The schools and sports summer camps need to be open. I have two sons that will be sophomores at CDM in the fall. It's time to get back to work. If parents want to keep their kids home, that is their right, but don't punish the majority who believe it is safe to be back on the field. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Black. You're on mute. I was almost done. No. <laughs> Reopening planning. Citizens want to be involved in the planning of reopening of our schools. How can people be on the committee, the subcommittee? I encourage you to make this a community project and reach out into the Costa Mesa and Newport Beach communities and involve people so that the neighborhoods are informed about what is happening. There's a great deal of mystery surrounding the reopening and summer school plan to make up for lost time in the regular classroom. We pay you well, yet you seem to operate in a vacuum and the community is always waiting to know what you are doing. You have a PR person. You could have Facebook town halls. There are plenty of ways you can be more transparent in our community. Please try. Thank you. Okay, I have Heather uh, Dayton Luttrell. In light of the COVID pandemic and schools being shut down abruptly, it is very important to find normalcy for the students. Create more outdoor activities, allow classrooms to reopen, and definitely no masks. Add into daily classroom life, washing hands and other clean, uh, cleanly uh, habits to create routine. If necessary, temperature checks to help parents and uh, staff feel more comfortable. Uh, Mrs. Black read the, uh, the, uh, the comment from submitted by Mrs. Lease. Uh, Ms. Matoyer. My comments are from Megan Guess. Please reopen schools all day, every day, without the children in masks. Their academics and their social and emotional well-being is more important than the COVID risk. We are willing to sign a waiver. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Lee Sung. Those were all the comments on item 10. Uh, actually, there was one that was sent to us via email that was requested to be part of the comment. They just couldn't include it because of the graphs. I don't see That's that. correct. And um, you all have copies of that. That was from uh, Jason. Um, I don't have his last name, uh, but you all have received that along with it was just too large. So you have you have been sent that and you have that and it'll be put in the record that he, he made a public comment. Is there no way to read the first 400 words or the first part before graphs? Because that was uh, no, because we couldn't. Um, he also made a set, had a secondary request to add additional people to his uh, his first public comment. So uh, Sherry's been in communication with him. Okay, I just feel like it's important for public comment to be shared. You know, not just. I mean, I'm glad we got to see it, but I think it's a public comment for the public. Um. It's up to you, but I felt that um, I don't know. I don't have a I don't have a legal opinion on it um, because it was there was a number of of items that were listed along with it. So I don't know which part you want to break out because it all is directed to some of the surveys and some of his slides. So the question is, we since we can't show the slides um, and much of his comments are directed towards that, I think it's in our best interest not to show it because you know, then we could be accused of, of censoring some of his information. Okay. Perhaps we can make an arrangement that, um, and I'll talk to Sherry and uh, maybe we'll, we, we can hold it over to get it to Russell because he has a copy of it um, and hold it over and maybe uh, see whether we can figure out another way to do it for the June 23rd meeting. Okay. And I, I, 
if he could if he could if he could adjust it without the comments then we could hold, we could i can put it over to the 23rd and get him to have so that he has the comments and in the past we sometimes been able to read sections for our board report of comments. I just, there's are some like, there's four bullet points, which are the main point of the letter. And I just feel like it's, it's a shame not to share them. I know, I, I'm sorry, but it was just too large. And it had, it had, um, we, we couldn't, we had no way to put those comments up. So um, that's what we're gonna do. Okay, thank okay. you. Okay, uh, I, I appreciate the dialogue. I haven't seen this, um, submission, so I, I can't really weigh in on an opinion here. Uh, is it related to reopening? Yes, related to- Okay, uh, I, I, I think- I think related to a survey that he-, he Yeah, uh, so so here, here's an important factor. We're not taking action on anything related to reopening. So uh, I feel more compelled if we were about to take action on something, but this is not an action item. It's really just an update that I'm gonna provide to the board. So let, let's hold on to it. We'll analyze that and we'll definitely um, uh, read it into the record uh, as appropriate next time or the gentleman can resubmit it uh, for the next uh, opportunity. Okay, but the good thing is we're not taking action at this time. Great. Okay, Mr. Lisson, item number 10. Yes, so Dr. Navarro did ask me to uh, give the board an update on the progress of our input gathering uh, related to uh, the reopening and the start of school uh, in 2021. I would like to share uh, a slide and let me see if I can do this efficiently. Okay. And this is the slide that uh, I know you are all familiar with and many members of our uh, staff and public this on the little uh, three minute video where I was describing the process that uh, how we would gather input and ultimately reach a decision in terms of our start of our school year uh, amid uh, COVID-19. So uh, this chart is pretty much the same as the one on the video except the colors are a little bit different and there is a new uh, bubble that's up in the upper left hand corner and that is a decision that we made to do a district-wide thought exchange for any parent or staff member or student or community member to weigh in on their thoughts related to uh, the, the upcoming school year. And uh, that has just concluded. We're currently in the stage of analyzing that data and putting it into themes where we can utilize that feedback into any information that we make to the board. So that's a new piece. But meanwhile, uh, I do want to share an update that we have held our first superintendent's advisory uh, committee meeting last week. It was a, a really a wonderful discussion where everybody had a chance to share their thoughts and weigh in on their perspectives on what we should be doing in terms of our reopening. Uh, we have another meeting scheduled this week. And I'm gonna ask the group if they'd be willing to meet either later in the month or into July or August. So that meeting and that group is underway. We've also had several focus group meetings and we will continue with those this week. Some have been held. I understand the parent, I'm sorry, the student advisory uh, group met uh, this week. Uh, I will be meeting with the parent advisory group classified and certificated this week. Uh, the principal groups are currently meeting and special ed has also met. So those groups are underway. Again, having deep uh, discussions and insights into their perspectives and thoughts into our reopening. And then below, we have four different groups that are around certain challenges related to any plans. And I do wanna clarify this because I did get some questions directly from some parents that uh, we have not made decisions. We have not made decisions on any key uh, aspect of this plan. Uh, what I listed here on the bottom were simply considerations that showed up in the various guidance that had existed that we should consider. So decisions have not been made, yet teams are starting to meet around these particular areas. And so once we get uh, the feedback and the input from the group over the next week and a half, 
uh, we will be using that feedback to share with the board. And I do want to uh, announce this, that we will be scheduling a study session uh, with the board. Uh, it will be open to the public uh, next week, mid next week. We have not yet set the date. We need to check calendar dates and times, but it will be sometime mid next week, where we will then uh, share the feedback that we've received. And uh, also we will have had a chance to analyze the recently released guidance from the California Department of Public Health, which came out on Friday. And then the California Department of Education released a guidebook yesterday and held a webinar. So these are very large documents that we are currently analyzing. So by the time we have the study session, we will be able to have a much more rich dialogue and provide information to the board and allow the board to weigh in on your thoughts and uh, direction. A decision will not be made at that study session, but we do plan to have a recommendation made uh, by June 23rd. So that's a quick update on the progress of our uh, developing of a um, reopening plan. Uh, Dr. Lee Sung, are we able to post on our website uh, the CDE, uh, Tony Thurman's report, the, the, th the 65 page reopening report? Can we, re can we get those both posted on our, on our website? Yes, absolutely. We can, we can put links uh, to that document as well as the California Department of Public Health. They're, they're readily available on the internet, but we can certainly put that on our website as well. Okay. And the, the other question is, we, will, we are working hard not to impact because we know that there are graduations occurring. So we are working that they will not impact any of the, the live broadcasts of the graduations. Um, Absolutely. I, we want to make sure that we are all available to uh, view uh, and in some cases participate in uh, uh, these broadcasts. Great. Um, I have two hands. Uh, Ms. Matoyer, you had your hand up. Do you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. Um, doctor, doctor, I keep giving you that title. Mr. Lee Sung, could you please let the public know what the open dates were for the thought exchange and how we opened it up to the public? I know that I received it in a constant comment email and there were Twitters and things like that, but I would love for you to share how that happened um, in case someone is only listening to our board meeting and saying, I had no idea. Although I have to say my eye doctor knew about it. So there you go. Anyway, would you mind sharing that, please? Right. Thank you. Our, our public information office uh, has a communication uh, system that whenever types of communications or thought exchanges, uh, it goes out through our full network uh, through a variety of methods. So I believe the open date was last week, Tuesday. It's either Tuesday or Wednesday. And we always like to keep it open through the weekend and uh, we included all the way up until Monday. So it did close on Monday. And, uh, and like I said, these, uh, I do know that we had thousands of comments. So there was no shortage of input that was being provided of, on this thought exchange. And we do wanna make sure that we have enough time to analyze the data and to be able to use it as part of our decision making. Great. Um, also, also, Ms. Barto, you have a question. Yes, I first of all, I just want to applaud the hard work that has gone into this. And I've seen a lot of the, I took the thought exchange and going through, I was one of the later ones to do so. So going through all the questions took quite a while. So I appreciate the community's input um, and all the hard work that your team has put into this. Um, I want to ask for a list of the parent advisory group when you have a chance to just kind of know who the different parents are. Um, and then additionally, just to, um, you know, this is really wonderful, but if we could let the public know what approximately we're going to make some kind of decision, um, I think that would, a lot, would alleviate a lot of concern. Right. And, and obviously, we, we want to get to a decision as quickly as possible. And uh, by the time we have our next board meeting, June 23rd, we should be able to bring forth a recommendation to the board in terms of one of the most important decisions that I think everybody is waiting for, and that is, uh, you know, what type of model will we be using? And I've said this uh, in the past, and I'll, I'll, I'll say it again, that we need to be prepared, not just with one scenario, but with multiple scenarios, 
because our conditions could change. And the other thing is, where do we start? We might have three different scenarios at different levels, but where do we start on day one is I know another very important question for everybody. So uh, that will be discussed at the study session, what our options are, uh, the, the way that I feel that we should be prepared to implement one of three different options and be able to switch uh, seamlessly. We heard that in some of our comments today, how important that is. So to going, and, and this is a question of more of a process question, but we know that it's, it will be a public meeting um, of the board in public. Um, it will be a study session. I, again, um, it, it has more to do with process. Um, we don't know when it's going to be publicized, but I would encourage, I think we have to make an exception that we, will, we, we, we can start taking comments and as long as they put it, I mean, we've got to have some way of, of allowing for parents who can't attend but want to make comments. And we don't know what the date is, but I would like to say that if, if tomorrow we can set up a process that says you can start submitting uh, public comments um, relative to it. So that if we can start looking at, you know, right. as soon as possible so that we can have comments and, and people can actually report, you know. Yes. So, so thank you for that. I, I will we'll both work with uh, the superintendent's office and we'll try to post that uh, much earlier than maybe normal. Okay. And then that'll officially give the notices to everybody and the, and the process to submit comments. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Ms. Yelsey. Yeah, that's part of my question, but I was actually going to ask Russell. I, I know there's been a lot going on in the last couple of weeks. So there are people who may not have known about the thought exchange or didn't have time to participate because I'm getting questions or, or actually people are asking, how can I provide some input about the opening of schools? So is, yes. whether it's later or now, could we have a line that people can just submit their comments or suggestions right. so we can get as much input right. as we can? I, you know, th thank you for, for mentioning that. I, first of all, I, I don't believe it'd be practical to reopen the thought exchange because we're already in the data uh, kind of processing stage. But, you know, uh, and there's been no shortage, and all of you can attest that you know parents or community members or anybody who wants to send an email, they certainly can do that. And we've received some very thoughtful emails, and I myself included. And I've been trying to respond to everybody who sends me an email, uh, but uh, whether it's the concerns or questions or even, and I appreciate this, ideas and solutions. So we welcome that, and so nobody should uh, hesitate to share their thoughts and opinions, even through a good old-fashioned email. So in that case, should I need to put this all on you. Should they send the email to you directly? To Who would you like them to go to? You know, uh, many have. Many have. Uh, they send it to the superintendent's office, and it finds its way to me. Um, so... Can I make a suggestion? They're, they're, they're most comfortable with. Then, Russell, can I make a suggestion that we uh, ha establish a reopening at NMUSD so that they go directly to a, an email address that is specific geared towards reopening so that it's all, they're all collected in one place? And it seems to me that it would be, you know, reopening 2020 or something like that at NMUSD. So there is a there is a there is a repository of all the comments, and then then somebody okay. can model. Yeah, a, a one stop shop. I, I appreciate that, and we will definitely look into doing that. We'll make it easier for everybody. Perfect. Thank you. Um, uh, Miss Anderson, you had a question. Could we perhaps just set up a Google form so then parents could directly go in and set? They can write their paragraph or their sentences, and then it just we can just go in and read that. So. It's not creating more work for anybody. It's just all, it's collecting it all in one place. I think we're thinking of very complex things and we can just make a simple Google form and have it, it all collated together. Um, Annette just said that we have a feedback at NMUSD. So feedback at NMUSD, we've got it already set up. It's there for everyone. Okay. Well, but that's a general feedback email for anything. And it, again, she would have to go through and if half of them are about sports, 
and half of them are about academics, it's difficult to discern. So I think we need to separate them. I think it's just okay. Being, okay. Uh, and then Russell, uh, the I other question is, and, and, uh, the, oh, I'm, Ms. Barco, did you, I'm sorry, you have your hand up again. Yes. Yes, I, I actually was asking it before, but I, but it was okay. Um, my question was, so a lot of parents are concerned that the email went out regarding programs refers to sports in the fall. And they're also concerned that school reopening means no summer reopening for the pools. And those are two different discussions. Right. Um, I want to make sure that that's really, really clear. And like, can we talk, can we speak to that about how those processes are going? Because that's different. I, I, yeah, and you know, especially since we're not able to have an in-person graduation, then you get into this overlap. I want to kind of delineate how that all works. So I think a lot of people are. You know, we're getting a lot of calls from about and uh, emails regarding uh, our facilities and sports, and I think we have that has to be a completely separate issue versus reopening because that's that's not right. You know, um, I, I I hear all the uh, questions and requests to reopen our facilities uh, just for, for use, uh, our, our uh, pools and everything, but we also have the, our athletic programs. And I just want to say that Dr. Baumeister uh, has been working very closely with the principals and the athletic directors. And we recently got our hands on some national guidance uh, with some standards on how safely to reopen uh, uh, athletic participation and it's uh, sport specific. So I was uh, very pleased to see uh, that he had gathered that. And quite frankly, it's almost like a whole separate plan here that we need to create. Where, because not all sports uh, are, are the same in terms of uh, their contact and the facilities use is very detailed, very impressive. I also know that the state of California uh, will be uh, releasing some guidance specifically to athletics and extracurricular activities. So kind of an add on to what they just released on Monday. So we will look forward to that. Uh, of course, we want to get our kids back on the fields and in the pools and everything, but we need to again do this in a very coordinated fashion to make sure everything is in place before we open that up with some uh, appropriate guidelines. If I could ask before, so we sometimes wait until we have like every single duck in a row and we have some sports that come sooner. So it makes more sense if we really focus like, okay, it's summertime. We're getting tons of requests to open up our pools. Can we set up a sequence of events? We don't necessarily need to deal with baseball yeah. for next spring if, you know. Well, they, they all they all tend to do summer stuff. And, you know, I'm going to hand this off to Dr. Baumeister, who I think is ready to share a little more details in this area. So, Dr. Baumeister. Thank you, Dr. Mr. Lisa. Uh, I met with the athletic directors this morning, as Dr. Lee, uh, Mr. Lee Sung said, is we looked at the COVID-19 guidelines mm -hmm. to show them the things that they would have to do to reopen their programs. And as he said, we got guidance for opening up high school athletics and activities from the National Federation. And so we had them look at those guidelines. They're gonna go back and talk to their coaches about it. Our summer programs would not start until July 6th, no matter what, because there is a summer dead period the first two weeks of summer. That would have happened even if we were hadn't stopped anything or anything. So we do have some time to be able to look at these guidelines to look sport by sport to see what they can do to open their sports. And as Ms. Anderson said, um, you know, cross country and track and swim are, are a lot easier to social distance than some of the other sports. But I can tell you the coaches are already looking at these guidelines, looking at these recommendations of what they have to do to safely open their facilities. And we are starting to look at those plans uh, and we'll bring them back to you probably in a couple weeks. But we, we wouldn't do anything even at the earliest until July 6th. My, one of my questions is I've gotten emails from people who are use our facilities. So again, it's the facilities use piece. And I think the sooner we can get kids active and engaged, particularly in pools, which is very common here, the better. So thank you. And I've been working, they've been contacting me too, Ms. Anderson. So I've been working with them. And so they're in the loop and they understand too. 
but we uh, we agree with you. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Flora, um, I just want to make one more comment. Based yeah, we have yet. Yeah, uh, Ms. Kelsey has a question. Yeah, I, just, I have a question for Kirk. Um, you say July 6th would be the normal date we'd be back in, but as we know, we're not in normal times, and it's not like the kids were in swimming pools or on tennis courts in June or in May. So they've been off for a long time, so you would think if, if it comes down that, that we can reopen some of these facilities, we should be prepared to open them so kids Maybe they're not practicing for their CIF sport, but they're at least getting physical exercise to practice in sports. I think that's really important. It's a, it's a CIF dead period. It's their rule that all of the schools follow. And so again, our kids cannot meet with their coaches. They can't meet together at teams during that time. That's just a normal dead period for athletics. And it's a CIF dead period. All schools are like that. that uh, I just saw um, Capo's opening there is July 6th. Irvine is June 22nd because they got out before us, so they've already had their two weeks. So that two-week period, that two-week layoff, is a CIF dead period that we have to follow. And it's based on our our end of the uh, our end of school. Yes. Oh, but it doesn't apply for non-athletic teams. Like, if someone's coming in to use our pool, it doesn't. They're not under CIF. So I guess I'm not understanding. I had the same question. So we will have to meet with uh, facilities and operations because I'm not sure we want to open up outside programs before our kids get in. So those are some of the things that we'll have to look at because as Mr. Lee Sung said is our people are concerned of who's been in our facilities before we come back. So these, these will all be parts of our discussions, but I got to tell you, I've been telling the, our user programs that they probably wouldn't be starting before July 6th as well. And they, under, they understand that. Uh, but these are conversations that we'll have to have. Thank you. Okay, uh, great. And, and I, I would encourage you all to look at the guidelines because they have, uh, they have I just was on it, uh, they have identified uh, higher risk, moderate risk, and lower risk of sports. And high risk is wrestling, lacrosse, football, competitive cheer, and dance. And moderate risk is basketball, volleyball, baseball, soccer, uh, uh, water polo, gymnastics, field hockey, tennis, relay swimming, and other track and girls lacrosse. And low risk are individual running sports, individual swimming, gold, sideline cheer, and cross country running. Those are the lowest risks. So they've, they've done a quite a bit, quite an extensive job on that. I'm really impressed with what I'm reading so far. Yeah, so anyway, um, moving on, Dr. Mr. Lee Sung, you had another comment? Uh, Mrs. Floor, I've had my hand up for oh, a I half an that. hour. So, I didn't see it. Well, I would like to hear from Annette Franco. To be honest with you, we, you know, we have an impressive person in our district that I feel should be able to explain about communication. And, and she's the expert. So I would like to hear from her at this time. She's had her hand up or has been chatting and hasn't been responded. So. I haven't seen I haven't seen a chat from her and nor have I seen your hand. I apo I sincerely apologize. Because okay. okay. I'm paying attention to the the pan the group the lines here, not the hands on the screen. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Ms. Franco. Hi, good evening everyone. I'm Annette Franco, Public Relations Officer for our district, and I did not plan to speak tonight, but I did want to touch on a couple of things. One is the thought exchange. We did send an email in English and Spanish to all parents in our district. I apologize for the crying toddler upstairs. Um, we sent an email to all parents, Spanish and English. We posted it on all of the schools and the district news feeds. We also promoted it on social media, and we sent an email to our community who's not directly connected to our school. So neighbors or other people that are just interested in our news, we sent that via constant contact. And we received the most participation we've received today in a thought exchange. We had more than 5,000 people provide nearly 7,000 thoughts. Um, so it was great feedback. There's a lot of information to go through. So I think we'll have really good information for our action groups and our committees as they plan for the start of the school year. 
The second thing I did want to touch on is that we do have a district-wide email. It is feedback at nmusd.us. We get lots of emails and we direct them to the appropriate departments if our office is not able to respond to them directly. And we're happy to do that. Whatever the topic is, we can direct it to the appropriate person for a response. So Great. those are the updates I wanted to share. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, moving on. Uh, Mr. Lee Sung, anything else on item number 10? Okay, we're moving on to our student board members. Um, first of all, this is their very last meeting and I want to thank them all publicly on behalf of the board. What a fabulous job uh, you all have done. We are so appreciative of all the hard work you have, you have put in. And also in the last in dealing with the COVID of serving and talking to your colleagues and your, you know, your friends, um, relatives, um, and acquaintances at your school um, via Zoom and safely about the questions and, and coming up with some and really participating and giving us some very um, insightful uh, you know, experiences that you've experienced. So, um, we, so we have them again. Um, we, ha we had the questions and, I, and I'm going to read them because most of them don't know. Um, I want to thank Dr. Baumeister and Mr. Lee Sung because I'm assuming that they they've also posed the questions. So the first question was, what would you hope would um, continue into the regular classroom from distance learning? The second question that we asked them to um, answer tonight was, what is the one skill that you learned or perfected during distance learning that will benefit you most in the future in your future plans? And three what has you most excited about being on your school, being back on your school campus? And the first one that's here is Carolyn Brewster from Corona Del Mar High School. Car Carolyn? Where is she? I know she's here. I don't, I, maybe she's not. Is she here, Carolyn? Bailey just said that her computer died. <laughs> So, okay, so we'll go, we'll move on. We'll and wait to see if she gets it back up again. Hopefully she'll get back up, but we have Catherine Fram, Fam from Costa Mesa High School. Okay, um, good evening, President Floor, board members, cabinet, and guests. I'm Catherine Fam, the student board representative for CMHS. And first of all, I would like to say thank you to everyone, especially teachers, for adjusting to distance learning so quickly. And you all have made the rest of my junior year and I'm sure everyone else's years go more smoothly than it could have with this pandemic. So um, my answer to the first question, although distance learning is not ideal compared to an in-person classroom, obviously, um, I think the thing that was most beneficial was turning in assignments via Google Classroom online because less paper was used and it's a lot easier to organize my work online. So. I didn't lose anything and I didn't have to sort through my folders and I hope that will continue into regular classrooms. Next, um, throughout distance learning, I learned how to motivate myself and to work harder without the influence of my peers. Like, you know, at school, I'm like comparing myself with my peers, but during distance learning, I feel like I've become more academically independent. And additionally, time management is another valuable skill that I obtained. Seeing as our class our time for classwork was no longer bounded by a 90 minute period. I had to, you know, do that on my own time. So for senior year on campus, hopefully, I am most excited about a classroom setting and also playing volleyball again. I miss in-person learning and face-to-face -face interaction with my peers. And if we are allowed to start athletics around July 6th, that would be very exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Um, and, and I'm glad that you're coming back uh, to Costa Mesa High School. You'll be a wonderful addition to their, uh, their senior class. Are you, are you going to be an officer next year at, at Costa Mesa and Lydia ASB? Um, I'm not in ASB, so okay. no. Okay, you're just really busy. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you. Uh, Luke Graham, Early College High School. Is Luke on? He may not be on. Yeah, he, uh, he's, he's not on. He's not on. Okay. Uh, we'll go to Kenya Rocha from Earl, uh, Estancia High School. Is she not on yet either? Yeah, unfortunately, I did not sign on either. Okay. Um, Bailey Bogard from Newport Harbor High School. 
Hi everyone, I'm Bailey. I'm from Newport Harbor. So for the first question, I completely agree with Catherine on this one um, in terms of turning assignments in on Google Classroom. That seemed to work very efficiently. Along with this, something that I hope to continue is I saw a change recently, about a month ago actually, in this whole process was the change from busy work to actually engaging work that really got me involved in the topic um, from you know TED Talks and stuff like that, creative ways to learn the information. And I, and I hope that that can continue throughout the year, next year. Um, the second question, what is one skill that I have learned or perfected during this time? And I would say the art of collaborating without actually meeting with another person. Um, we found creative ways to make our presentation online, which will save time in the future, which is a good skill. And then the third question, what has me most excited about being back on school? And that is obviously school spirit. Um, that's unfortunately hard to transfer over the internet. And so being on our school campuses, posters everywhere, um, our Battle of the Bay game, stuff like that is, um, I'm very excited for that. Thank you. Thank you. And Bailey, are you going to be doing, what are you going to be doing next year? Uh, in terms of ASB? Mm -hmm. I will hopefully um, be on the board, uh, be a board rep as well. Great. Great. Um, and then we have Madeline uh, or Maddie McNamara from Back Bay, Monta Vista. I think, I think she's on. There she is. Hi, Maddie. Hello. Hi. Um, my name is Madeline McNamara, and I go to Back Bay. Um, I'm a junior right now. And um, what I would hope for is to continue in regular classroom from distant learning. I hope that the com uh, communication stays the same with the teachers, like being able to email or text or remind them when there's a problem and maybe we're not in the classroom or something. What, um, one skill that um, uh, I learned during the distant learning, um, while I learned how to communicate a lot better with my teachers, like I've already explained, like now I'm asking more questions and I feel mm -hmm. that that's better for me, especially for the future, if that does happen again. Also, I would like to say that my mental health got better when I was able to learn to adjust to the whole distant learning thing. So if we do have to do this again, that um, do this again, I think that that part of me will understand and be okay with it and adjust really quickly to it again. What has me most excited about being back on my school campus will obviously being able to see my fellow classmates and teachers again, even though that we're not able to hug or anything like that. Things like that, but we'll still be able to uh, see each other and not be looking through a screen. I think that that's the most exciting part about being back in campus. Great, thank you. And again, um, I wanna thank uh, Dr. Bauermeister. It's my understanding that you wrote the questions and we really thank, um, thank you for that. Um, and Carolyn, I don't think she's been able to get on, um, but I will like to tell the board, uh, of the board, the public, um, that we are going to a new process this year. Uh, several of the board members, uh, as you may have, we may have mentioned before, before COVID hit, was that we were going to um, really be judicious and provide uh, student board members an opportunity to apply, um, and they would have greater responsibilities than just reporting activities. Um, and as you can see, we have been moving them into that direction with asking these specific questions. So we will be conducting interviews. We have applicants from every single one of our schools um, and the board will be um, interviewing them. They've submit, they had to go through a do an application. They had to get letters of recommendation. They had to do post a video of themselves and then they're going to go through uh, an, an, an interview process with the board members. Um, and then we will be formally appointing them, I believe on June 23rd. Um, so we're very excited about that, uh, that process. Um, and um, it'll, be, it'll be great to have a greater engagement. And we wanna thank um, the, the students that applied and also the students that were participating through the Student Advisory Committee, that they're, they're just great. Um, and so thank you. And uh, if you wanna sign up, you are more than welcome to do so. Um, the next one we have is uh, the Harbor Council PTA with uh, Julie Lenk. And again, this is Julie's last uh, meeting. Uh, we did send certificates to you, Julie. I hope that you've already gotten it, um, as well as we did that to the student board members. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to Julie. Sure, if I can. Um, Mrs. Snell is, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, 
Julie Link is not here tonight. Um, she okay. has a family um, emergency. And Vicki Walda was going to be here to present the report, and she is not available. Okay. So what Mrs. Link sent was the new president is Lisa Bowler, and the executive vice president is Cynthia Strassman. And Great. that was her report. Okay, terrific. Thank you uh, very much. Um, so we'll move on to our association presidents. Uh, uh, Dr. Dowdy, would you like to go first this time? I know you're, there you are. So good evening, uh, President Floor, um, members of the board, Dr. Navarro, members of the community. I am Britt Dowdy. I'm president of the Newport Mesa Federation of Teachers. And um, June is always a, a, an opportunity of kind of excitement and sadness for our members. Um, and it, it's, you know, the excitement that we uh, always see is at the end of the year, um, you have a chance to reflect upon the, the growth of students academically as well as just emotionally and, and sometimes physically throughout that year. And um, our teachers and other educators have definitely been seeing that and that uh, seeing how uh, students have really um, gotten through a very challenging uh, fourth quarter and uh, the vast majority of them have been very successful and as as they can see doing uh, report card comments or, or end of semester grades or kind of the counseling with kids, uh, they can see that in tremendous worth that students have, have, have done. Um, and that is just a team effort from everyone in the entire district. Uh, and we want to acknowledge that there's a lot of hard work done by the people we represent, but also all of that behind the scenes work uh, done by our classified employees uh, that was so foundational just to making sure that the district operations remained afloat and that kids still got the food service and other support services they need. And also the hard work by the administrative team uh, in helping make a lot of things happen in a short amount of time. So it was a collective effort to see these kids continue to be successful. Um, it's also uh, sadness. You know, kids are, are leaving your class and moving on. And definitely uh, for, especially kind of like in the elementary schools where you've seen kids at your school site for maybe five or six years and you don't get to see that closing activity of how they promote, uh, you, you know, and we know that uh, some teachers like to attend the high school graduation from kids that they had when they were very young. Uh, and what's really neat is this video-based system still gives that opportunity for everybody to see the graduations. Uh, so while it may not be everyone's first preference, it is definitely gonna be something unique and special that we're, I think everyone's looking forward to watching the, the graduation of these young people. Um, but there also has been, uh, you know, just elements of frustration that, that everyone's bearing, uh, both as a personal level going through things and still trying to figure out how to do the work uh, and still manage your day-to-day -day activities. Um, and there, there also have been just tons of decisions getting made uh, as we're changing policies and how we do our work. Um, even decisions that are getting announced, you know, the last day or two about how we're closing out the semester. And um, I think that teachers have, have um, worked with as much grace as they can in being flexible and adapting. Uh, you know, it's tough when you kind of make a game plan for the end of the year and then uh, you have to change plans at the last minute to accommodate, you know, some um, uh, changes that are being made to try to help kids uh, get through high school or middle school or finish out the closing year. Um, and it's an area that I think, you know, we can collectively reflect on this and do a better job rolling into next year in terms of how we do our uh, procedures and get ready if we have to resume distance learning. And there's a lot of lessons to learn here. I think collectively, uh, we're, we're, we're all working really hard. We want to acknowledge that. Um, and we're, we're trying to be flexible and go through things as best we can. So uh, we're very proud of the young people uh, closing out the school year. Um, we're very proud of uh, seeing them grow and mature, and we wish them the greatest success as they move on with their life if they're leaving Newport Mesa. And uh, we, we're very excited to work with kids when they come back to school again in August. Thank you, Britt. And on behalf of the board, uh, I can't tell you how many comments we as board members have received from parents um, and family members about the extraordinary mile um, your members have taken in reaching out to parents. Um, we've heard countless stories from our principals about teachers 
reaching out and trying to identify kids that were just completely disengaged and whittling the number down to three kids that they know. Uh, and that takes extraordinary effort that it's not, no longer is it that our, our teachers are just having communication with our parents at three different times of the year during parent teacher conference, back to school night and open house, but they are continually reaching out to parents and getting to know their, their, their kids' families and the family situations and the trials and tribulations that they're going to. And please thank everyone because you, they have done an, an enormous job and we are so grateful for them. We're just absolutely grateful for every single teacher that's in our district and they are part of our family. Um, so thank you for that. Um, the next one is Pam Saunders with our fabulous uh, CSEA president. Hi, I'm, yes, I'm Pam Saunders, um, the president for CSEA. Uh, start my video, sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, first off, I would like to just um, talk about a fun story about some of our cover drivers. And I did send this to Sherry to share with the board earlier today. And it was just one of our um, students at one of at Sonora had left her um, stuff there on on one of the buses the day that the schools closed. So the bear sat in the bus for two and a half months. The aunt had written. A written a um, she had wrote wrote an email to Tracy in transportation and asked if they could find the bear. So the two cover drivers found the bear, but in the meantime, they went around with the bear and took it all over the district, put a mask on it. It went to all the different departments. So they ended up writing the the the, the girl a letter from the bear of all of its adventures. I have missed you so much. It's a wonderful to be home. I wanted to tell you a little bit about my adventures the last few months. I've been very busy answering phones, cleaning buses, and making sure all the drivers are properly trained. So when school starts again, we'll be ready. I spent some time fixing computers and mowing the lawns at schools. I helped make sure that students got lunches so they would not go hungry. I helped drivers supplies drive supplies to the schools. I helped the mechanics start the buses. I even sat in Zoom meetings with all the leadership people who are trying their best to be ready when school opens. This was all very important stuff and I learned a lot, but now I'm ready to be home. I thought about you every day while I was working, but always I know you would be okay because you are the bravest, most fantastic girl in the world. So this was from two of our covered drivers, Scott Parks, who was one of our classified employees of the year, and uh, Robert, they call Scott Search Parks and Robert Rescue Bremer. So anyway, <laughs> it's gonna be posted on the website. Adriana is gonna post it on the district site and also on our CSEA site. But another thing I wanna recognize is that every year we have a everyday hero that we pick for CSEA in our group. And this year we have chosen um, Julianne Schaefer. She, she's a bus driver in transportation also. She always goes the extra mile to help us out whenever we need her for committees. So we're very happy. She's going to be recognized by the Orange Field Office. And again, I want to thank you for this opportunity. Um, our classified have been, some of our classified have been brought back to work this week. They're working, rotating, alternating schedules with coworkers for safety. Our custodians are still there every day since the beginning to keep us safe. Nutrition services employees are still working tirelessly by serving breakfast and lunch every day. IT has um, still has the tech, the tech centers open up at the district and Ray to swap out Chromebooks and the help desk is still answering phones and, and answering me emails. The warehouse is still delivering and receiving mail and packages. m and is doing limited work maintaining everything. We have essential workers all over the district working from home. Every classified employee in the district is doing their part, whether working from home or at a site or just staying home to protect all of us. Thank you again for this opportunity. Again, thank you, Pam, and please thank your members. Again, unsung heroes in all of this. Yeah. I mean, we've served over a million meals to our students. We didn't ask, they were from, they were little all the way up to the age of 18. We didn't ask whether they were residents, we just served meals and you prepared them again, 
you kept us safe, you've done your job, and it's been very difficult, but we so appreciate all of the work. I want to do a special shout out to Awesome and the IT department. Yes. And, and to Jenneth Mishney and the ET department, because without these two individuals and their departments, lots of things would not have happened. Awesome getting all of those computers, seven, we have it on the budget, $791,000 in computer purchases that we needed to make, but over 500 hotspots, uh, Jenneth Mishney dealing with all of the various applications, making sure uh, that, that both those departments, food services, transportation, um, they've, had, they've had the easy kind of off, but um, they've been working really hard, and they're 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 just going to be starting um, our maintenance and operations, keeping um keeping our our facilities that we have worked so hard to maintain and keep in tip top shape are looking still looking great. I like those fields; they're looking great. They just want to be used. We need to use them now. Um, so again, thank you both for all of your hard work, and please thank the thank, thank your associations. We couldn't have done it um, without you as our part of our family. So. Um, we really appreciate that. And Thank so uh, now uh, we have a uh, report on the results and action item from the Newport Mesa COVID-19 thought exchange seeking feedback on distance learning and related topics from the community, parents, staff, and students. You think it could be a longer <laughs> description, but I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Lee Sung. Okay, um, so this will be uh, Jenneth uh, Mishney's uh, report. She's our Director of Educational Technology. And I will tell you, uh, through this crisis, there have been many people who have had to step up to the plate and do amazing work. And right at the top of that list is Jenneth Mishney. And so she was our main person to administer this um, thought exchange for our district at a very uh, important time to get feedback. And as you heard some of our students responding to uh, how changes and adjustments were made uh, for the positive, uh, that was a result of uh, some feedback that we got uh, through thought exchange. So. I cannot congratulate and thank uh, Janice Mishy enough and her staff there, a very small but mighty staff who just did amazing work. So, Janice, you are on. Thank you very much for that um, wonderful introduction. I appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. I'm going to go ahead and share um, my screen. And I do have um, Dr. D'Agostino with us tonight. Um, he'll come in at the end to talk a little bit as well. So um, yes, I shortened that title. Um, and uh, so it is exciting to be able to come back and talk to you about this thought exchange, even though you know I know we're really anxious for the, the one that just closed. Um, but it's nice to, to look back because this time period was April 30th to May 8th. And that was just a couple weeks into like our official distance learning after spring break. And we, we put these you know, two very open-ended questions out to our community, um, asking them and just, you know, why, why do we do a thought exchange and not um, a survey? Because we wanna hear what's important to everyone. And, um, we give people who are typically quieter the space to share thoughts. Um, it works on the ideas around crowdsourcing where we want to hear, um, you, you know, your ideas, everyone's ideas out there. And we aren't asking that you respond to our ideas. Um, and then it's a really fair process where everyone's given an opportunity to share their ideas and not just the people who have, may have time to come to a town hall or a meeting. So this really encapsulated what I felt we were doing, which is a great quote from Maya Angelou, do the best you can until you know better, then when you know better, do better. And 
I think that's, we are all here trying to do our best, but we absolutely can continue to do better. We just need to know what that is. And by getting input from all of these stakeholders, it really helped us to, to focus in on some areas that we could grow. Thought Exchange does a really neat thing where they create a word cloud based on all the participant groups. And the way a word shows up larger is because of the frequency that word showed up in the thoughts. So this is all participant groups. And as you can see, at the time, homework was a big deal, <laughs> as were assignments, health, stress, mental, those were, those were a lot of the big things that came out of it, this thought exchange. And just a, a reminder for those that are new to thought exchange, it, it's three simple steps. You share, you star, and then you can discover. And so you share thoughts or questions or comments. And once you've done that, you can go back in and read thoughts shared by you and other participants and rate each one out of five stars. And you can also discover. So that thought exchange, you know, everyone's thoughts are in there for everyone to see. Um, and you can explore all the thoughts. And as uh, Karen mentioned, um, you know, it could take some serious time to go through that, especially when you have a lot of thoughts. Um, but it's fast, effective, and I, I'm a geek, but I think it's kind of fun. <laughs> the thoughts and the stars are public, but as to whose thoughts and stars they are, that remains confidential. Things to keep in mind are the comments with the ratings of 3.6 or higher means the group is in high agreement. The participant groups only rate comments within their group. So we had community members, parents and guardians, staff and students. So students only rated student thoughts, parents only rated parent thoughts, staff only rated staff thoughts. But we also had the ability to have our thoughts in English and Spanish. So if you entered your thought in English, it would translate over into Spanish. And those that entered thoughts in Spanish would show up over in the English comments. So that was really another really nice feature of um, this thought exchange. So we, until the last thought exchange, we were the highest. This was the highest, <laughs> no competition there, um, number of participants with almost 5,000 um, participants and just a little over 4,000 thoughts. But what is even better is that we had 131,158 ratings. So, so people went in and, and rated and participated that way. Uh, we broke it down into education bands. So when you went in to take this um, to participate, you had to select which one I, you identified best with. Um, as you can see, high school and middle were a, a big portion of our thought exchange participants, um, then elementary, and then we had um, preschool multiband and a couple that just didn't choose to identify with um, an education band. The school zones as well, um, you can see for the most part, we had pretty even um, with you know less in the Estancia zone, but the NAs are, we, we're thinking they're early college or um, some of the, the schools that not sure which zone to pick, so they just picked that. Um, and then this is just a slide to really look at all the thoughts, the participants, the thoughts, and the ratings. And you can see um, the parent guardian group really shined here. They participated the highest, but we had really good participation in all of our participant groups. Um, our community members, when you look at their comments, they are really comments that are, they're really our parents also just identified as community members rather than selecting a parent or guardian if you, you know, if you get into the comments. So that group really, um, while some of them may just be community members without ties necessarily to the district, um, a lot of those comments really were um, parent comments. So I'm, these slides are here just to share. I'm not gonna, you know, be just because we're of limited time, it breaks it down into each participant group for those of you interested in the more statistics to see um, how that looks at each of the different participant groups. Uh, 
So you can really identify that. Um, and then I want to talk just a little bit about the process. So once this closed, um, you know, uh, Thought Exchange has artificial intelligence that creates these themes for you and, you know, based off keywords, but then working with um, Christine from Thought Exchange, who's just amazing to work with, uh, she then we worked and we took it down to our themes, themes that we really wanted to focus on, like distance learning and, you know, overall needs and concerns and graduation was a big one. And, um, and so we broke it down and then we shared those results, uh, first with Expanded Cabinet, then individually with elementary and then secondary principals and gave them some, you know, asked them to go back and share with their uh, staff and teachers and we shared the results with NMFT and CSEA, as well as student and health services. Um, so we really wanted, the idea was um, to get this information out to everyone so that we could ask them what, you know, what things could change. And as, as we already know, many things changed the minute that everyone got their hands on, um, on a lot of this information because it was necessary. So, while there was a big theme around appreciation, and we, we know that um, we are all working hard, you all just attested to that, we're doing some great work that really, you know, and so I don't want to, you know, lessen that, but this was really to look into areas of growth and ways that we could improve. And so um, looking at, you really want to look at your top three, 10, 20 comments in each of the areas because those are the comments that resonated with most of the participants in that group. And so the top three thoughts in our community members, I mean, this is so, you know, to me, so telling because um, in January, I met with uh, the superintendent's parent advisory group. And this top comment was, it came out of there like, you know, so strong, this top comment. And that is that we have just too many, too many sites, too many apps, too many systems, right? So this is just evidence that yes, we know that and we are, we are so working towards that, but it really came up as something we have to change and have to do better with to help our parents, our teachers, our students, our staff, right? To, to get better at that. Um, a thank you, and then as a parent being overwhelmed, um, that's just really a big uh, concern and something we, we want to address uh, moving forward. So top three comments for parent guardian is um, wanting a consistent schedule, a place where we, you know, another one about all assignments in one place, it's actually the two top comments there. Um, staff members, great job for um, food services and um, and then the concern over the return. Uh, so that came through this thought exchange as well. Um, and then students, as we heard, which I'm just, my favorite part of board meetings right now are student reports, um, is too much work, stressful, um, and then really wanting the graduation. So we took all of this and synthesized it down into some areas to focus on. and. Um, and to say, yes, we heard you. Um, workload being one area, and, and that's across the board, but definitely around students. Consistency of schedules, assignments, communication, platforms, technology, graduation, fall 2020, and then social, emotional, and mental health were big ones. So some action items that have happened since this thought exchange is um, teachers are now providing one-to-one -one family support, um, working more closely with them, and, and th these action items came from our teachers. Um, they changed their schedules. We've heard it from the students, how they responded to hearing about, you know, the overwork, and I loved Bailey talking about going from um, the busy work to the engaging work. Um, that's, that's what we want. Um, so we've responded to student needs, adapting lessons um, and their stress levels. We changed secondary grading scale, removed grades from elementary report card. And then even you know, more recently, the decision to end instruction 
early for 12th grade and then tomorrow for um, 9th through 11th grade to allow for incompletes and finals. Um, in the areas of technology and platforms, we are now working towards uh, commonplace for all assignments. Uh, we're looking at a, a class link portal for students, staff, and parents that would put everything in one place. They would go and be able to just do a single sign on. Um, we are looking at streamlining our learning management system to be able to really house our content. Um, and then also we're recommending actually tonight at this board me meeting that Seesaw for Schools uh, get approved because um, it's been really powerful. In fact, um, I got some just data from Seesaw and uh, over the last five years, our, our usage increased 40% in the last like six weeks over the last five years. I mean, greatly. And so um, that has been a great tool for them. Um, as you know, standardization of teacher technology, we, we had initially thought Chromebooks would work for teachers. Um, we were also looking at one week, two week, three week, you know, in the beginning. And we know now that that is not um, a, a, an effective tool for teachers. It's great for students. So IT has, you know, working on that plan to equip all NMFT members. Um, and then teachers that really couldn't do things at home were then given the opportunity with the, working with their site principals to work in their classroom and, um, and that the equipment rollout will begin after June 12th for those um, laptops. And then we are looking at standardization of student technology, hoping to be one-to-one -one with Chromebooks for TK-12 by September 2020. Um, virtual graduations were planned. Fall 2020, as you know, we have committees formed. We're looking at guidelines from the state and then the, the thought exchange and all of that input we're getting from everyone. Um, and then social, emotional, mental health. Uh, from the ed tech services side, we launched an educator wellness mission into our Ludo Expedition um, gamified online PD. Uh, teachers made shifts to adapt to student needs. And um, I'm working also closely with Angela Castellanos and this summer we're creating some um, SEL teacher activities in Aludo that are aligned to the district initiatives. So I, before I turn it over to Phil, cause he's really gonna talk more about the changes and the things that are happening um, with social emotional, is I wanted to, let's see if this works. Can you see this, the thoughts? Yes. So this is um, on slide 25 of that presentation. And these are the top 20 thoughts. And so I wanted to show you how um, you can click and just look at a participant group, parent guardian, it will resort and you can see the top 20 thoughts um, that the parents, you know, felt were resonated with them. These are all rated at, you know, 4.2 or higher. 3.6 is in high agreement. Um, I can sort by the education band. I can click more filters and sort by the zone. But I can also pick a word like stress and I get every thought that has stress. Um, worried. Oh, look, no one's worried. Fall. <laughs> Let's see. Did I mess this up? All right. One of these words really, um, all right, it's not showing up here, but you can sort that way and, um, and then, you know, just look at the data based off of uh, a keyword or in your particular zone and thing in that respect. All right. Am I back on my presentation? All right, so these were our overall needs and concerns. Um, and I'm gonna actually turn over to Phil. You have the next two slides and let him talk about this. Thanks, Jenneth. So do I have this slide and the next slide? Is that? Yes. Thank you, Jenneth. Fabulous. And you'll, you'll, you'll flip it when. Um, yes. So uh, good evening, President Floor, Vice President Yelsey, board members, executive cabinet. Thanks for giving me the opportunity to share 
the work um, we've been doing on the student services side. Um, we uh, obviously have been hearing for quite some time uh, since the middle of March that uh, mental health and wellness, uh, anxiety and depression is, is, has become rampant, not just in our community, but across the state and across the country. Um, we, are, we are poised in student services to, to identify the needs of our students and families, and, and this tool that Jennif has rolled out uh, and that Mr. Lee Sung has rolled out uh, through the Thought Exchange has been very valuable. So as you can see in, in this slide um, right here, there is a lot, as we anticipated, uh, a, a lot of thoughts uh, around uh, the issues of mental health. And so what uh, we did, uh, as we know that we were going to come out of this, uh, this pandemic at some point, we've been positioning ourselves in student services to be prepared to offer resources, uh, systems, uh, interventions, uh, when we're called upon to do so based on the information that we have. So what we did, a couple of things that I've been involved in, uh, is, uh, is to take these thought exchange ideas and I've had an opportunity to talk to secondary principals and I've had a chance to have a robust conversation with the elementary principals as well. And so Jennifer, if you hit the next slide, what we asked the elementary principals to do was to look at what do we need to do between now and the end of this school year, our phase one within student services, what would you like us to do between the end of this school year and over the summer? And then what would you like us to do moving forward in the 2021 school year? And we broke off the elementary principals, not by zone. We actually broke them off uh, randomly so that the wide diversity of principal experiences could be shared by one another as opposed to having a much more homogeneous zone group talking within themselves. And that way, um, I think we're able to hit all the needs that students and families um, are, are going through at this time. So if you look at this slide, I think it really summarizes in, in, in a very good way what we need to do in student services and what we need to be prepared to do. Uh, so through June 19th, we're going to uh, continue to support uh, students and families through our behavior specialists and the work that our social workers are doing. Your decision to move towards hiring behavior specialists to support general education students, I think, was absolutely brilliant. Um, we continue to see that as a strong, um, a, a strong uh, voice of support from the principals about the work that they are doing. So we're very excited about that. Uh, over the summer, as you can see, the big thought there is for us to keep the uh, care and support line going. And uh, I, I think you're going to, I think you're going to be hearing some additional information about the care and support line later on tonight from my boss, Dr. Jockham. But that that is a uh, a big uh, thought that came out from the principals for us to do that. We're going to continue our welfare checks. We're going to continue over the summer uh, with our child welfare and attendance investigator. Um, his work has been uh, invaluable in identifying students and families and, and providing the linkages for support uh, across the district. And then um, the, the big thought for the 2021 school year is that when we are called upon, we will be prepared to educate, train, support teachers, uh, principals, students on trauma-informed schools, the trauma-informed classrooms, the trauma-informed response to student behavior, and we will create synergy between PBIS, restorative practices, the evidence-based practices in mental health, uh, and, and with uh, Sarah Coley, Angela Castellanos, Kristen Henry, uh, Candy Barella, uh, myself, uh, our team is, is working uh, uh, day in and day out right now, uh, pos positioning ourselves, putting the resources where we need to be so that when we're called upon, uh, I think once the superintendent's advisory on the reopening makes its recommendations, we anticipate to be called upon to, um, to, address, to address these needs. So uh, yes, it's challenging times, but there isn't any place uh, we would rather be in student services then on the front lines uh, working together with our colleagues uh, in the various divisions. So thank you for allowing me to share these slides right now. Perfect, thank you. Uh, and, uh, yes, and that is, 
that quit. There we go. All right. Um, that is all we have for you on that thought exchange, but we are excited about um, having some action items, having things that we've already done um, to make things better, but moving forward, definitely have um, areas to work on. Terrific. Um, Janet, do we have the ability to, to send out a thank you and acknowledgement to those who participated? Is that, is that a possibility? No, it's anonymous. Okay, okay. I mean, that's part of what makes it work is that anonymity. Anonymity. So on behalf of the board and on behalf of the district office, we would like to thank all of those who participated. Um, we encourage you anytime with, that we're doing this, we want to hear from you. We want you to hear your thoughts. We want you to share those thoughts, those concerns, all of that, so that we can make better informed decisions. Um, I love the quote, and I think a couple of the board members love the quote also from Maya Angelou. So thank you very much, both uh, Jenith and, and Phil, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, the trauma-informed classroom and what we envision um, the training to help support our teachers um, and our students. So thank you very much for that. And I do have a couple. I think Ms. Um, Ms. Matoya, did you have a comment or a question? I don't think so. Okay, uh, Ms. Bartow. Uh, yes, I think Karen may have been first. Oh, okay, Karen. No, I, I just wanted to thank Jenneth, not only for this with the thought exchange, and it is really exciting that we had so many participants, but for all you've done for the teachers. It's just been amazing, yep. and um, a lot of them would not have been able to do what they're doing without your input, so thank you. Thank and you. Phil, as always, your department is going to be on the forefront. Of, of what we need to do. I think we all realize by having this distance learning that the unintended consequences is, are going to be the effects of, the, uh, of what it's done to kids um, and families in general. Um, and I appreciate you putting in place now all the support that you are because we're going to need it. So well, thank you. I couldn't have done it without my incredible team and my digital fellows and coaches, I have to say. Thank you, thank you. Ms. Bartow. Um, uh, yes, I, I wanna second Karen in thanking the IT team, Jenneth. This is such a heavy lift and you guys really worked so hard, so thank you. And then Phil, I think I wanted to second that too, that going back, our mental health challenges are gonna be different, but they'll probably be greater than when we left. Um, I wanted to address a couple things that I heard from the community. Um, about the thought exchange, whether it makes sense or not. Uh, Jenneth, I'll defer to you. But a couple of things that people had asked was to do thought exchanges by grade level. They felt that they would have participated if, if there was one for high school, middle, elementary, because if they had an elementary or if they had a high school, they felt like it was too long to go all the way through. So food for thought, I don't know if that affects the robustness of the study or how that would work, but just wanted to give that feedback. Actually down, sorry, actually down to the grade level, like so first, second, third, and second. No, no, sorry, elementary, middle, high school, like three different thought exchange. Oh, separate. Okay. Separate, yeah. Because sometimes they get very long, and I think, uh, and then if the questions are related to high school people who have elementary, for example, kind of give up halfway. So that's okay. the feedback that I, I heard. Um, and then additionally, um, I think there are maybe some still outstanding Chromebook and hotspot issues that we should look into. I was on a call uh, with another charity that I work with with uh, my daughter and they, the three charities that were on there talking about what they had done mentioned that they had given out um, several, you know, tens. Each charity had given 10, and 10 to 15 Chromebooks and hotspots um, to students in our district. So maybe the need that we aren't seeing is because these charities are filling the gap. I'd just like to know like um, if we aren't supporting them or if we would, didn't reach them or if by the time we heard from them they'd already been helped by these charities. Just something that, to make sure we understand, especially going forward into the fall. Um, and that, yeah, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Michelle, if I can just comment, as a district I'm really proud of the work that we've done. We are committed to provide every kid who needs a Chromebook a Chromebook and those that are having Wi-Fi issues also provide that as well. So if, if you know of any student who is still having those issues, please uh, 
have them call the, the hotline or their principal and, and we will uh, contact them directly. But, but that's, that's our commitment as a district. Great, thank you. Ms. Anderson. Um, I just wanted to make a brief comment. Thank you so much for having the um, Karen support line open over the summer. I think that is such a valuable resource and I know so many parents have been helped. So thank you for, for doing that. Terrific. Um, Jenneth and Russell, do we have, do, do schools, individual schools have the ability to develop or work with thought exchange on a thought exchange specific to their school site? We can assist them with that. Uh, there's only so many admin access that they allow the district under our account, but we can certainly assist them with that. There's no, no question that we can do a more localized uh, thought exchange. Great, thank you. Okay, any further questions on that? Outstanding, and again, thank you, Jenna. Thank you, uh, thank you, Phil, as always. Um, you're on the front lines, and thank you for listening to about the, the multiple applications. Because as a grandparent, my kiddos are doing the same thing, you know, and it's just it's overwhelming, overwhelming. So, thank you for that. Okay, so we're moving on to um, another wonderful different type of recognition. Um, for our, we have two CIF champions, Corona Del Mar Wrestling and Costa Mesa Cheer. Uh, Kurt, Dr. Bauermeister. President Fleur, members of the board, cabinet, and distinguished guests, it is that time where we recognize our winner CIF champions. As you know, we usually bring the students in and we hand them certificates. Uh, we couldn't really do that. So the, just so you know, the athletes have already been given their certificates. That part has already happened. Tonight, we have our CIF championship coaches with us to speak about their championship seasons. So we're going to kick it off with Coach Mark Alex, wrestling coach at Corona Del Mar High School. And wrestling is not a sport that we've traditionally had a lot of CIF champions. Um, and maybe Coach uh, Alex knows when the last one was, but I think it's been a while. So uh, Coach Mark is with us, or Coach Alex is with us to talk about his Division VI Dual Meet Champion, uh, Coach Alex. I saw his name on there. He dropped off. Um, he did? Yes. Okay, then we will go to our second. Uh, uh, Costa Mesa Cheer with Coach Corey Johnson. Uh, they have actually repeated as CIF champions. And as you know, Costa Mesa Cheer is one of our most celebrated, uh, celebrated and decorated programs in our district, receiving national honors year after year. And so at this time, I'd like to introduce Corey Johnson for her to tell us about their Division Four co-ed traditional cheer CIF championship. Coach Johnson. Hi, um, I'd like to thank President Yel um, Thor and Vice President Yelsey. Um, and all the board members and Dr. Navarro and the cabinet for recognizing us once again. Um, this is the second CIF championship that Costa Mesa Cheer has won um, and the second time that any cheer championship has been able to be won by um, a cheer team since CIF has finally recognized us. This is the second year that cheer is a CIF sport um, and um, we appreciate it every year that the board recognizes our, um, our wins. Um, I believe this is probably the 15th time that we've been recognized by the Newport Mesa Unified School District and we appreciate it every time. I want to thank everybody. Um, all the cheerleaders have been waiting patiently and they got an amazing education on current events and um, so I appreciate that and I think they got a, um, an awakening on what's going on and what you guys all do and what you've been doing during this COVID time. So I do appreciate everything. Um, that they learned tonight. And I think they and their parents appreciate it as well. Um, the girls and the boys worked very hard this year for their CIF championship and um, their wins in Florida as well. Um, they're eager, very eager to get back to practice so they can defend their championship title again. Um, and hopefully they can return to practice soon safely. Um, so um, we appreciate it. They appreciate they did receive all of their certificates in the mail this week. They let me know. And um, we are very grateful for your recognition um, of this team and we appreciate it. So. 
Thank you. Do uh, Kirk, I know that we was in the board packet a picture of them. Where's the pic? Can we can we get the picture up of the two teams? Uh, they do we have that ability. Sherry, do you have that? No, I don't have it separate. It is attached to the agenda item. I it was published on Friday. If you give me one second, I can pull it up and just put it on my screen. Great. You. Because, I mean, I think it's really important that we yeah. Can... Give me one second, and I will pull it up myself. Perfect. Um, Thank you. I believe this is the one, and I will put it up on my. I don't know if that's good enough. Here they are. Right there. Okay. there we are. So you can oh, see. God. Yeah. So there's their CIF championship patches and picture. That work. Hey. All right. Yay! Thank you. Thank you, Corey. Another job well done. And, and hopefully, we'll have a, a three peat next year. And um, one thing that they're going to do with CIF and cheer next year, they actually are going to have a Southern Regional Championship. And so the winners of the CIF Southern section will move on to um, a regional competition and um, we can win a state championship with CIF as well next year. In our division. So and not only we will is, bring that back to Costa Mesa as well. It, not only is Corey uh, Johnson the cheer coach, but she's also a health assistant in our district. So she has she wears multiple hats as as well as the most important thing, a parent of two children in our district. Well, no, my son graduated. He's a college oh, student right. now. So we have one that is desperately waiting to get her driver's license and can't do it because DMV is closed. Right, and I am an alumni of the district too, so I wear many hats, but. Thank you, thank you so much. So we're now moving on to the consent calendar. Um, Mrs. Black. All items listed under the consent calendar are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by the board in one motion. This includes the consent calendars for business, education services, human resources, student support services, and superintendent. There will be no discussion of these items prior to the time the board votes on the motion unless members of the board, staff, or the public request specific items to be discussed and or removed from the consent calendar. Public requests of items to be discussed and or removed should be submitted in writing prior to the board's consideration of the consent item calendar. Uh, I have not received any from the board nor the uh, community um, so we will move on. May I have a motion? I'm um, so moved. Um, Martha, I have, yes. I have my hand up. I just wanted to ask a question that I just noticed. Oh I'm sorry. I didn't see your hand. I apologize. Go ahead Mrs. Anderson. Um, thank you. It is on number uh 16 a3 i noticed that part of the change order there was a nine thousand dollars seven hundred and forty one dollar charge for um extra work on a saturday and i was just wondering if i could hear more about why we needed someone to work on a saturday for almost ten thousand dollars Is this, uh, this is under business? Mr. Yeah, Holcomb? it's 16A3. Uh, Mr. Holcomb, are you able to answer the question? Right now I'm looking um, at the uh, backup uh, for this item to understand Ms. Anderson's question a little bit better. Um, You know, I, I don't see anything that will give me specifics to answer her question specifically. Uh, I can look into it some more. Our contractors work weekends, so uh, in order to maintain their schedule, uh, and that's probably what occurred in this, in this situation, but otherwise I don't know any more details. I would have to look into it some more. Okay, if you could get back to her um, by the end of the week, that would be great. Thank you. Is this, is this, is this, um, do we need to pass this today? Does this, this, does this item? 
need to be approved today. Are you okay, Ms. Anderson, with having it staying on the agenda as long as we get the information to you? Yes. Okay, perfect. Terrific. So may I, uh, so Ms. Okay. Ms. Matoy, Ms. Matoy wait, oh, you guys need to use your, 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 your hands. I, 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 have, <laughs> I use my button. My button's up as well, but that's okay. It's, not, uh, it's interesting. Okay, go ahead. Um, if I lower it, can you see it now? Yeah. Okay. Now I can do it. Okay. So I keep, um, my question is not related so much to uh, the items on here as just understanding if we are um, on schedule for the pool maintenance and what that looks like. I had some questions from the city. They wanted to know um, how our pool construction was proceeding this summer. So not so much a, I don't need to have questions on that specific item so much as to know how if we're on schedule to do those things and just make sure we share that information with the city. That's it. So are we on schedule to with the Are you talking about Newport Harbor High School and the shade cover and the stuff like that? Yes, yeah, so um, the items are 16 A4, that's the sports field, so that's not that one. Sorry, 16 A3, uh, 16A2 and A6. Uh -huh. Looks like. Yeah, uh, uh, they, we've author we're off tonight, we're authorizing the bids, so they'll be going out to construction. Correct, Mr. Holcomb? You're on mute, Mr. Holcomb. Mr. Holcomb, you're on mute. Um, yes, all of this work is. All of this work has been scheduled to be completed this summer. Perfect, great, thank you. Uh, are we able to share that um, timeline with the city at some point soon? With the city? Send him the agenda. I don't know whether he hears us. Mr. Holcomb, um, once we award the bid, you said that it's going to go, um, to go out um, and we will start, we will award the bid tonight and then construction will start during the summer, which is basically in the next couple of weeks. Um, can we share that information with the city? Or will, do you intend to share that information with the city? He's on mute again. Can you hear us? Mr. I'm Holcomb, can you hear us? Can you hear us? He's not. Um, so Ru Russell, it may yeah. be an issue with, with streaming, but I am assuming that yes, you will take that back and we will get it shared. Yeah. With I, I've already okay. taken a note of that and we'll uh, follow up and get back to the board. Thank you. Um, or um, Ara, is Ara, is Ara, can Ara, can Ara speak? I don't believe she's. Uh, is Ara on, is Ara here? I, I don't think she's on the panel tonight. I can, I can move her over right now. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Oh. Martha, while we're waiting, I think I would like to pull 16A3 if it's not urgent. I would like to know, I mean, it's $10,000. If we're trying to maintain all of our pennies, I think I would like more information before we approve it. If we- We already spent it. They already did the work, right? So yes, I'm here. That's great. So how do we not do that? Okay. Are we standardly letting people work on Saturday and charge us extra fees? Would you like me to speak to the items? Um, Ara, can you, Ara, can you speak to them? Yeah, I'm not Others. sure my my video isn't working, but can you okay. all hear me? Yes, we yes. can hear you. Okay, so if we go back to, I believe it was 16A3. Um, yes. which is approved change order um, number four. So that is the final change order for the increment one work. And so part of the challenge with having two increments for one project that was DSA approved under one scope of work is we had to shift some of the work from increment two to increment one to get all of our sign off with the health department 
And so there were some um, changes in that attachment. If you go down to attachments, you can see the detail of it. Um, and then there are just typical of any construction project, there are things that the architect and design team missed. And so when you see T and M, it's because we needed to get the work done in a timely manner. And so what we do is we have the inspector um, monitor the hours that they spent, so the T, which is time, and then M is materials. So they literally say, okay, this wall, all of the framing of this wall was corroded. It wasn't in the original drawings. We didn't anticipate it. So we're gonna do that work on T&M to get the work completed. And so you'll see a few of those T&M items, and then you'll just see scope shifting from increment one, from increment two to increment one, because we had to get that work done in increment one to be able to open the pool and no increment two was coming. Um, architects, they miss things. So some of these items are just things architect missed. Um, other items are unforeseen conditions. And then it was just kind of the back and forth between increment one and increment two. Uh, and we are uh, essentially done with increment two now. And we're just doing other things, little things working with the site on that wasn't covered in either increment one or increment two, such as the coaches offices. So we didn't want to finish off increment one and increment two and not go in and rehab um, the coaches offices. So there's other things associated with the overall project. But in terms of increment one, this is the final change order for the contract. Um, and so it is important to, to approve it tonight so that we can issue our notice of completion because we've already taken off occupancy of the pool. Uh, the next one. So, Ara, let me just, uh, let's make clarify. So, Tim said in his um, brief statements that we typically have contractors who want to finish work on weekends because they are, they, they have, there, there are certain parameters in terms yeah. of completion. So, we have, is this typical that we, we have individuals that, that complete work on the weekends? So depending on what activities were happening on campus. So there was work because we had a fully operating school site that there were certain activities we couldn't do during a normal business day. So they did have to work Saturdays to have certain items completed, absolutely. And that is very typical, especially at the end of a project. Okay, thank you. Okay, going on to the next one. Which was, it was it 16A4 or? Uh, it had to do with uh, the Newport Harbor, the aquatics, which was oh, so the so tonight you're approving the contracts. We went out to bid for the new aquatic scoreboard and the new practice bill scoreboard. So we've received those bids. You're awarding that contract today. The overall project has been budgeted. So this is just a matter of uh, hiring the, the contractor, giving them the uh, authority to proceed. These projects are ready to go. They're just waiting for your board approval. They're itching to, to start and we'll start here shortly and we will complete these projects this summer. And just so you know, I have had direct communication with the city of Newport Beach um, in regards to the recs department on both Newport Harbor pool and the CDM pool because we're doing the fencing project at CDM. So that also impacted the pool. I've spoken to them as recent as uh, Friday. And these are being used, I thank you for letting me blurt it, these are being used from pots of money that have already been budgeted from this current years that we can't use for other things anyway, correct? Yes, they have been budgeted already. <laughs> they're 100% they're funded by you all prior to even these actions. Right, thank you. Okay. Sorry for my black screen, I don't know. Um, Ms. Bartow, did you have any other questions on a, a couple of the other items? No, those were, I just wanted to make sure that we shared with the city because um, especially with reopening their programs, we especially need to coordinate in summer what our plans are. Okay, perfect. Okay, so uh, Ms. Bartow. I, I moved, but Mrs., you wanna check with Ms. I'm, Anderson? I'm sorry, Ms. Matoyer moved and Ms. Uh, was it Bartow that seconded it? 
I don't know yeah. anyone seconded it, but did Black, you check Miss Anderson? Black. Did you check with Miss Anderson about whether she wa still wants the item pulled? Well, I will use it because I don't want to delay the second increment. But I, the school's been closed, so I'm. I think it's weird that they would have to work on a Saturday, but I'm not going to hold up the next phase of the project. It was before. It was before we closed the schools. Okay. Yeah, I believe it. This is floor. I seconded okay. the motion. Perfect. Thank you. So <laughs> it's been moved by Ms. Matoyer and seconded by Mrs. Black uh, to approve the consent calendar as presented. Uh, roll call, please. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Barto? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Ms. Snow had to step away. She was feeling ill. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Terrific. Uh, moving on to item uh, 17, resolution consent calendar. Uh, may I have a motion, please? I'm, I move <laughs> that we adopt 17A re resolution 28-06-20, finding the Costa Mesa High School uh, HVAC air conditioning program 2020 project exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, approving, approving the filing and recordation of a notice of exemption. That's as clear as mud. <laughs> so basically, we're saying that we don't have to do CEQA on the HVAC at Costa Mesa High School. And are you going to do the both of them together because it's a con both consent? Sure. 17B, Resolution 290620, finding the Newport Harbor High School HVAC 2020 project, exempt from the California Environmental Quality Act, and approving the filing and recordation of the notice of exemption. They're not CEQA either. I second it, Yelsey. Okay. So it's been moved by Ms. Matoyer and seconded by Ms. Uh, Yelsey. Uh, roll call, please. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Barto? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snow? Stepped away. Ms. Matoyer? Yes. Okay, so now we're moving on to um, consent, um, a pub public hearing. Um, I hope that uh, Mr. Lee Sung and uh, Jeff Trader, you will explain because this is a little bit different than we normally do it because of COVID and LCAP and all of that LCFF funding. So um, we do have some comments. And so I'm going to turn it back. We'll have the comments. We have a comment from uh, Ms. Lee, Ms. Uh, Yelsey. Yes, this is a time for you to hear the public comments on how you will be spending more than $300 million of our tax of our tax dollars. Last year on page 59, you will note the Irvine Company Endowment earned $278,900 in interest. In 1819, it earned $243,328, and in 1718, it earned $127,045. The purpose of this endowment was to provide educational enhancement projects in our classroom. Can I ask you, when so many students are struggling, why you have to let this money just sit there and not put the money into the classroom to help with these struggling students? Over the years, I have seen many str struggling NMUSD students at Juvenile Hall, Hall, Orangewood, and College Hospital. Why are you hoarding the money? You don't need it. You have healthy reserves. You could trim the administration and balance the budget. You could sell the banning property and it could become a beautiful park for Costa Mesa and Newport Beach. Now is the time, it is past time, to use the money the Irvine Company gave to the district in the 90s to help all those students get the extra help they need to achieve their goals and be successful. Thank you, Ms. Lee. Um, um, uh, uh, Ms. Anderson, Marty O'Meara. Yes, um, Marty O'Meara says, Trustees, you are finalizing your 2021 school year budget in June in order to meet the critical needs of your students in the fall. In the fall, you need to make some of critical budget cuts. All top executives need to take a 10 to 15% budget cut. Over $800,000 in lawyer fees need to be cut in half. 
over $800,000 in consultant fees need to be cut by three-fourths. All conference and travel fees should be eliminated. Mileage stipends of $1,000 to $8,000 should be eliminated. Cut the $1,369,000 transportation budget by $1 million and return all students to their neighborhood schools. How should you spend this money? Additional costs will include health and safety precautions, plexiglass, thermometers, face masks, hand sanitizers, cleaning services, etc. Add more teachers to meet the smaller class sizes and to help students who are academically behind before the pandemic and who are now significantly behind due to the shutdown. Provide a community facilitator at every school that can deal with the lack of internet services, parents needing multiple help with articulation, communication with school officials, possible food insecurity, housing, their students' placement, emotional problems, special ed, and others. Provide a summer school program to include pre-K, kindergarten, and at-risk first, and second graders, particularly for the 10,769 economically disadvantaged students in the district, many of whom have had no schooling during the pandemic. Provide a mental health facilitator at every school to deal with the emotional trauma of students and teachers. Provide an on-site nurse at every school to prevent the further spread of the virus. Reorder the district's priorities now and develop a budget with the students' urgent needs at its core. Terrific. Uh, thank you for both of you. Um, as I want to remind Ms. Lees, because she was on the board uh, during the time that the Irvine, found, uh, Irvine Company gave us the initial five, uh, five million, and the million dollar that yes, it was uh, for educational enhancements, but as you remember, uh, Mr. Donald Bren required to restrict it to only spending um, a percentage of the interest and as interest has decreased and we have been spending the, those portions that we are allowed to do and we are working with the Irvine company and we are trying to schedule meetings to see whether we can spend more. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Mr. Lee Sung who will turn it over to, I'm assuming, uh, I'm gonna, do I open the public hearing, correct? So I'm, oh, here's my pretend gavel. I'm opening the public, and you're on mute, Mr. <laughs> I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm opening yes. the public hearing. <laughs> yes, you may. <laughs> uh, Mr. Re uh, Mr. Lee Sung. Okay, and, and as you said, Mrs. Floor, this is not a normal uh, budget year. Uh, we had a really, uh, depth uh, study session uh, with the board uh, where we really drilled down into, into some of the specifics and was able to uh, provide Mr. Trader with some direction to build this budget. And I know he's got a presentation to share with you and, uh, and explain why things are uh, quite a bit different. But in the end, uh, we will make sure that we provide the support and resources to get through this crisis and to those areas that are, are needed for our students and staff um, through this pandemic. So Mr. Trader. Um, I have Ashley, Ashley, is your hand still up? Yeah, can I ask a preliminary uh, a question? I was wondering, since this is not like the completed normal version and we still can be getting new information hypothetically before we would make a final decision and approve it, can we call this instead and maybe have the public hearing be called the all funds preliminary budget because I think what's in here is not final. And so looking at the end of the presentation where it says that we're offering a positive certification and it's a finalized process, we're not really there yet. So I'm wondering if we can call this instead a, pre a preliminary budget. Okay. I'll let Mr. Trader answer that, uh, but this is the first step in the, in the budget process. So Mr. Trader, why don't you go ahead and I'm sure you'll shed some light on that question. That's a great question. Uh, you know, interestingly, uh, we have to adopt a budget by June 30th. We have no choice. Um, that's the, the law. And so um, adopting a preliminary budget probably just isn't going to fly. Now, we can, we will make changes, of course, at first interim 
Uh, that's uh, uh, where we have our first opportunity to make those changes, but we are um, uh, limited to adopting a budget on uh, by June 30th, no later than June 30th. I think we're under emergency circumstances, and so it's different than it would be normally. And I've looked at a couple of different districts, and they're calling it a proposed budget because June 30th is right about when we'll hear from the state. So it makes more sense for us to be waiting to outlook like that same day. And if we have to have a special meeting on that day once that information is released, I just I'm concerned with calling it final. I think we're in an emergency situation, and it's not the same as usual. If we have if we receive guidance from um, the Department of Finance and the CDE that we are allowed to call it a preliminary, I'm sure we are. But I so, uh, so far I have not seen anything that has come down from the state that says other than we statutorily have to adopt a budget, a final budget by June 30th. Just like the state has to adopt a final budget by June 15th, or they go in the legislature and the governor. So uh, they're under a time crunch too. The difference with them is that they don't get paid um, after June 15th if they don't adopt, but we have to, so. Okay, uh, we'll move on. We'll, we'll check it out though, Ashley. All right, so I'll share my screen now. So let's. Uh... Right, I, I had a quick question too. Oh, sorry. Uh, oh. Um, so I really appreciate the time you put into this report and giving us graphs to understand it. Um, this, the guidelines from the state come down on the 15th. Uh, we have a meeting on the 23rd. This budget book is about 130 pages. And last year's is like, yeah, we know. <laughs> big um so i and it's missing sections that we could have i went through sec like page by page it's missing it's missing a lot it's not just missing things that we can't guess um and some of the things actually i figured we would have to guess about were actually in this small book so um i, I just i just don't know i i would prefer to wait till the 23rd because what we've seen we've kind of seen three times in two study sessions and then it's the same information again and we're still missing 200 pages the, uh, I'll go ahead the, no, that, that, that's all. the parts that are are missing are the actual um, verbiage that goes with at the site level and um, at the program level and so what we have is you know for example um, principal I'm, I'm going to buy 10 pencils and or I'm going to get some, uh, you know, furniture for the students, that kind of thing, and and explaining that. And, and the issue that we had is our principals were um, tied up trying to uh, figure out how we're going to provide distance learning. And so we made the decision that we would, uh, the budget group would do their budget for them based on history. And so there is, unfortunately, there's no words to go with the um, with the budget at this time because we simply did it based on history. The sites are primarily budgeted based on for, uh, formula, and so they get so much per head, those kinds of things. And um, uh, uh, so there, so that's one of the issues we got. We we really don't have the words to go with that right now. Um, the budget isn't really written by the budget group; it's written by folks out at the sites, the principals, those, those, those folks. I understand. I just feel like if we even included a page that said what the amount was last year, what they spent, including that, that gives me that much more of a, an ability to kind of look at what I'm agreeing is the final budget, even if it could change. A lot of things are changing. We've had to, we're, we're going to change in October regardless, but, um, but a site site for site accounting is pretty important to me. And it would be the same as last year. A part of the assumptions was is that we did not um, cut their budget. So they got the same budget that they got last year on a per rate basis, on a per head basis. I think this is important feedback. And because we're not adopting the budget tonight, we are adopting the budget on the 23rd. This is the public hearing. Um, so I think it's important that you know, Jeff, take these into consideration, and and I'm sure that there'll be more. But this is so unusual because normally, again, 
um, because we were under LCFF and we had to follow those constraints, we normally had everything that the sites did was constrained was was developed in conjunction with LCFF, the requirements under LCFF, the funding. We we were able to target everything, and that's how we came up with the language. And so it's it's difficult when we don't have we can't do that. We can't do LCFF. It's been suspended. So it's got, like this is really very strange the way we're doing this budget. It's just uh, it's awkward at best. That's a really I good. I also point. want to remind the public that we used to have a dual adoption and they got rid of it. And we used and actually we used to have dual adoption. Our district was one of the very few, the last holdout in terms of we adopted twice. We did adopt a preliminary budget in June and then we did a final adoption in October. And that then, sounds lovely. Perhaps this year we should go back to doing that. I mean, so I mean, the thing that for me, there's still two things that are outstanding. So I mean, that that's helpful what you shared, Jeff, the site and the program level. So we're making cuts, though, in this current iteration to some program items, but we're not really able to compare what was in place last year. And so if those are the right places to make those programmatic cuts, or if there's other places, and then for me, one of the things that I've been looking at the new Mesa budget since 2012. I like look at them randomly. I know that's weird, but um, one of the sections in there are the departmental levels and it shows what's been used last year and it would show what is projected for this year. So even if it, and that's missing, like that's something that I think I asked in the study session, you know, is it what are we shaving? What what five percent? Which department? What what is happening in that? And so, based on again this this final version, it's not really a final version because we're not able to compare it to even what last year was and what we hypothetically would be spending. And those that's not some of the places that we're thinking there could be cuts. So I'm not I don't understand why those were left out. Well, um, we can provide um, we can together the numbers there there may not be a whole lot of written um, English with with those numbers if that would be helpful that'd be great thanks Jeff that would be that would be really helpful we understand that there's not going to be the rationale of the or the recommendation or the or, or what it's targeted for but if we can just have the if we can have the comparison numbers I think that's what the board is asking for you bet okay. I will I, we will yeah, do that I mean, if we're cutting the program, there's one program item that's for 200, uh, what is it? It's 254, it's 254,000. Well, is that necessarily the best thing to cut? For me, a programmatic cost that directly impacts students is not necessarily where I think that we should be cutting. And I can't see if that's what, you know, one department spends on something that's superfluous like printing when we're not going to be print we have huge we have thousand dollar contracts for printing we're obviously not going to be doing that at the same level if the schools are hypothetically shut down in any way so i'm just i'm concerned about us making programmatic cuts that don't need to happen when we could be cutting other things and i can't tell based on what i received in our itty bitty budget we'll take him thank you Okay, Mr. Trader. Okay, so uh, I'll share my screen now. So let's go there. There we go. Whoa, boy, this is little. Is that better? Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Excellent. Okay. So here we are at the Alphans uh, budget. And uh, it, again, this is a very different year. Um, this is where we've had the state has actually um, pushed the LCAP, the Local Control Accountability Plan, back. And, you know, the, the, that LCAP plan has become very integral to the budget. In fact, it really is the controlling document. It accounts for every penny the district budgets and spends. And so without an LCAP, it's a, it's a little uh, different. And so... Um, that's why you're seeing some, 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 one of the reasons why you're seeing some differences this year. And so we do, as we talked before, we have to adopt a budget by June 30th. However, we can make revisions at uh, our first interim in October and our second interim in January. And the crisis is uh, certainly this health crisis and the economic crisis has added a lot of uncertainty. 
And as you'll see tonight, these forces are ending up in the numbers and we are facing a very serious reduction in revenue and increased costs at the same time. Um, I, you know, I dare say that, that we have never faced this much uncertainty before. We really have not. And so we hope this situation is short lived. However, it could be with us for some time. However, the good news is that you're well prepared to successfully continue your leadership of enriching the lives of our students and the community. And so we've taken your guidance to produce a budget that can withstand the dramatic revenue reductions that are going to happen and still not, and at the same time, not touch the core program and continue moving forward with your priorities. And I want you to know that we have worked really hard to um, honor your leadership in this regard. Um, as such, you know, you will, you will see teacher to student ratios maintained. You will not see layoffs. You will not see budget reductions at your school sites. And the students under your care will no doubt benefit from the stability that you have engineered as a matter of policy. And so let's talk about the state budget process. Here's the state budget process. It is um, uh, pretty uh, stable. However, most of the time, what gets adopted in June is pretty much the May revision. However, this year, the governor and the legislature are on completely ends of the spectrum. And it remains to be seen how the governor is going to uh, negotiate these differences. And that's adding a lot of uncertainty for us. <laughs> and, you know, because here we are days away from the state adopting their budget, and we still have no idea how they are going to deal with us. And so uh, with that, then we've taken your guidance. And um, due to the crisis of the, the economy, that you know, we are facing some uh, revenue reductions in total of about fourteen million dollars, and the board had you know the board recognized the scope of what we were facing, and so you called two study sessions on the budget during the month of May, and in those t uh, study sessions you gave us clear guidance about how to approach the challenge from a policy perspective, and so in summary the board directed staff to have a minimal program reduction to make surgical reductions and to uh, do this with a modulated response. And so as such, you will not see, uh, you know, we did not take um, a, a same size fits all approach by implementing um, across the board cuts. We did not do that. Um, staff viewed expenditure plans through an essential lens and um, adjustments were made accordingly through that essential lens. And so uh, let's talk about the recommended solution structure here. The resulting structure is consistent with your guidance um, and it's comprised mostly of non-program solutions, 80%, uh, almost 80% uh, uh, non-program -solu non solutions. And the other rest is uh, with program support kinds of solutions. There's the non-program and then there's the program support. And the total, it's a non-program $9.8 million and uh, program support $2.7 million. And so um, let's talk a little bit about the district factors here, the big picture factors. Jeff, Jeff, you said you were gonna talk what that slide, what those actual items were. Oh, oh. Um, program support piece. Okay, so, uh, so so for the non non program piece, let me let me go back there just so we can. Thank you, uh, Ms. Ms. Anderson. Appreciate that the reminder there. So for the non program piece, the nine point eight million that's made up of the surgical budget reductions, the um, delay of facility uh, projects, or looking at restricted funding to take care of some of those things a transfer from your risk management stabilization account and uh, delay of fleet replacement and then a delay of our contributions to our uh, workers comp and other post-employment benefits actuarial um, uh, fund balances that need to be kept. And then on the program side, we've got um, 
curricular support for both elementary and secondary. We have off ratio on the secondary side, and we've got declining enrollment. That's good. We can score a little bit of savings there. We have the summer programs that we're unfortunately not going to be able to conduct um, like we would normally because of the health situation. And then we have some unrestricted um, professional development that can be delayed. And that makes up the program uh, uh, support side uh, of things. Is, is that help provide some clarity? Yeah, and can you share please with the public too what the summer programs are that are not in place? So there's a lot of people who are asking a lot of questions about that because we talked about it once, but if people didn't see it the study session, they don't know. Right, and I may need some help from uh, Mr. Lee Sung on this or, or Mr. Drake um, kind of go into the summer program piece of which ones uh, we could not do. Yeah, the summer program is our enrichment programs of the elementary and engineering. And as I stated in the um, study session, the, the, this one really stings because we're very proud of the, that program. Unfortunately, this year we can't provide it, but we're committed to bring that back in the summer of 2021. Mr. Lee Sung, it's not because, it's not because of budget constraints that we can't provide it. We can't provide it because we can't COVIDly safely provide it, so we just get lucky and get to save the money. Am I correct? That that is correct. Uh, you know, it's an unfortunate uh, timing that uh, the the fact we couldn't provide this it does allow for some. But uh, that's that is a good point. It's not because of the dollars. It's because it's very uh, impossible to offer that type of hands-on program. Weren't these also in conjunction with the city? This was the, with the city of Newport. This is the city of Costa Mesa, correct? The, the, not the engineering. The, not the engineering, not but the engineering. The after no, these are, program. these are both our programs solely. Both our programs, okay. But we have the other ones that also are not being funded either, to the city. Yeah, those are, I think you're referring to the city programs. Yeah, and they're not, be, uh, they're, they're not, they're not in operation either, correct? You know what? I don't know for sure, but I, they are under the same budget crisis that uh, that we are as well. So I, oh. but I can't speak to okay. exactly what they plan to do. Great. Thank can, you. Can we contact them and just make sure? Because I know they have a, they have more federal money, and so that that could be helpful and could help offset our costs. Um, I have one other question connected to the program support. Um, I noticed that there's one item on there that is the $254,000 cost. And if we are currently being constrained to, for fund 17 to only use the interest, which is 265,000, can we use that money for that? It's only for educational enhancements and this is a program support educational enhancement. So for one year, are we able to, can we do a one year adjustment and use the interest for that? Is that I possible? Think I think you're referring to the professional development piece. Is that, is that correct? No, there is one of the items that is on there that is um, underneath her, I believe it's curricular support. That's for $254,000. Oh, I see what you're saying. And I'm wondering if we can use the, it's it's an educational sub enhancement item, if we can use the interest from Fund 17 for one year to fund that. Well, it, it's more than just the interest. And I think, I think Jeff's ex tried to explain it a couple of times. It really is a formula based on whatever, whatever it is, the LIBOR or some sort of a, it's, it's not just interest that so we can, we yeah. can Essentially, we have to protect the purchase or the way the agreement's written up now is we have to protect the purchasing power of the endowment. And that means that, that we, uh, we have to earn more interest than the cost of, of living. And, and right now, the interest rate has been lower than the CPI, this consumer price index. And so we have not really been able to access that money um to stay true to the agreement and so yes we're, we're gonna have to do some work about looking at the agreement and and uh, seeing what the getting some direction from the board on 
how, how we want to move forward. It will, it will require some negotiations with the Irvine company. Yes. Okay, well, I would like, I mean, for something like that, that's an educational enhancement. Like, I think that makes sense to ask the question specifically around one item rather than a hypothetical. I'm not sure I understand. Um, yeah, I, I think we mentioned at the last study session that we would um, commit to do that work to make the adjustments necessary to uh, bring the proper approvals to the board uh, so that we can access the money. And I think that's what um, you know our main interest is, is rather than this money sitting there, let's adjust the rules and the policies and whatever negotiations we need to take, um, let's do that so we can access the money. And then I think a separate conversation will be how much money is available that's prudent to spend. And then we can decide in terms of how best to utilize that money. But, but I, th I think we all want to uh, be able to begin to utilize that after many years of, of, of not. Yeah, I'm, what I'm saying is this is a great item to use it to make the specific ask if we're going to talk to them instead of a hypothetical, like we might in the future want to use it this is a pointed, very specific reason why we would want to use it. Type and item those, in urgency. Well, what, what are those curricular do. enhancements specifically, Ms. Anderson? What are those? It, the reason I'm not saying it is because I was told that it was a closed session item. Okay. Well, again, I think, I think that the conversation is not necessarily pinpointing. I think we need to leave it broad because there may be varying differing opinions on where if we got approval, I mean the one, the salient point is we one, we need to, we need to get approval from the Irvine company to be able to be accessed more than what the agreement originally allows. That's the first thing. We have to get agreement on, on rewriting the agreement, period. The second thing is then we're gonna need to have some agreement and some discussion amongst the board members and the staff on exactly what, because I, Ms. Anderson, you may have one opinion on where you would like to spend the money, and then there may be Ms. Matoye, Ms. Barto, uh, Ms. Yelsey, Ms. Black, myself, Ms. Snell. There's seven of us who may all also have differing and varying opinions on where we believe the money, um, if we're gonna do what we consider our educational enhancements, and then of course, I just want us to start having those conversations. I mean, I'm not saying we have to do this one thing. I'm just saying it makes sense. It's less than the interest that's on there. So like, let's have those conversations and have discussions. So that that's all. Thank you. And I agree. And we're not disagreeing. But given the given the constraints of people not being able to get to work and people are now coming back. Um, we will start those conversations, but it has been, there has been a constraint in terms of having those conversations because I don't feel really comfortable having those conversations in Zoom. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay go so, on, going, going ahead, Mr. Uh, Trader, thank you. Okay, so t looking at the big picture kinds of factors, let's look at district revenue. And um, as always, <clears throat> most of our revenue comes from property tax revenue. And we have modulated uh, the property tax um, assumptions to account for the economic uh, slowdown, which we are experiencing. And then there's the state revenue. And you can see in the 2020-21 year, state revenue is significantly down. That little red box is, is substantially smaller than the other boxes. And that's because of the $14 million dollars that we believe the state is going to um, uh, reduce us by, and that will be in our minimum state aid. And then we have federal revenue, and you'll notice there that federal, that green box in the, in the budget year again, is larger than, than normal, and that's because of the CARES Act money, which we will receive, and that's about $3 million, and that will be very helpful. And then we have the other local money, and that's consistent throughout. Um, You'll notice though that we expect a bit of a recovery. And so that means that we are, that's indicative of a, a U-shaped kind of recovery or a swoosh shape. And so we're uh, very hopeful that that's going to occur. However, we're prepared if it's not. <laughs> so then let's take a look at revenues and expenditures and uses. And so in order to fulfill the board's priorities, 
um, we've um, we've spent a little bit more than we've taken in on occasion. Here's the revenue line, looks good. However, in 2021, you see revenue is dropping. But then when we apply the um, expense line, you can see there in 1819, we're way above that line and we continue to be above that line through uh, 2021. And of course, that's not sustainable. Um, the red line uh, has been on top on a temporary and planned basis. We plan for that. And as discussed in the session on May 29th, the 2021 budget does contain a slight unrestricted deficit condition of $1,102,584. And as such, we have some more pencil sharpening to do, um, and we look forward to closing that gap as we get more clarity around the crisis, the state budget, and upcoming negotiations with our unions. And so then let's talk a little bit about another concern. Pension rates are another concern. Um, the governor's budget does include a reprieve from the pension rate increases. And however, the temporary reprieve um, only buys us a little bit of time. However, there's still uh, his, uh, this reprieve is very, very helpful. There we have the CalPERS line. You can see there it's a slight reprieve in 2021, but then continues up in the out years. and. Here we have Calsters, we got a reprieve there, but again, going up in the out years. And the impact mm -hmm. that is that that means that uh, pension costs are going to consume a larger portion of the, the budget. And so here we have the dollars, the actual dollars for pension costs. And, but then when you apply the percent of budget, you see there, that red line, we get a reprieve here in 2021, but then it starts heading back up. And so it will be 11%. So pension costs will be 11% of our budget. And to give you some perspective, in 1617, pension costs only consumed less than, just less than 8% of our budget. So it's con it continuing to consume a larger and larger piece of the budget pie, so to speak. So it's a concern. And then we have enrollment. And enrollment, we expect the trend has been down. We expect that to continue. However, you notice in 2021, the uh, curve is bent slightly. And that's because of, we expect, expect some influx of students from the Huntington Beach City School District had, that has, uh, they have changed their inter-district uh, transfer policy. And so we expect some students from, from that. So let's take a look here at some of the numbers. Uh, for the general fund summary. So looking at uh, our estimated actuals for this year going into next year, you can see here that the beginning fund balance is very stable. Look at those two green numbers, very, very close together, um, very stable. Let's take a look at revenue. There's a few things going on with revenue that we want to uh, take a look at. If you look at there, those green numbers, LCFF sources, uh, going down into the budget year, and that's because of uh, the state cutbacks on us. And then we have the federal dollars, which we're going to go up from 540000 to to uh, $4 million, $3.982 million, and that's very helpful. Overall, though, if you look at the total, revenue is going to be down just over $5 million. And then we have the expense comparison, and if you look at the total here, that is the smallest I've seen, the smallest increase since the Great Recession. It's only going up 0.8%, less than 1%. I have not seen the breaks on expenditures like this since the Great Recession, and so uh, that's helpful. And then we have, of course, the other sources and uses comparison. And you can see there, we continue to um, um, uh, make sure we have uh, provide resources, do nu nutrition services. And then there's also in the green there, the transfer in, and that is the transfer from the risk management stabilization account and to help us uh, get through this uh, uh, challenging year. And so then you look at the ending fund balance comparison. This is the ending fund balance. Um, you look at where we're gonna end the year this year compared to where we'll end the year next year. And you'll see that uh, it's on the unrestricted side, there is that $1,102,584 deficit that we need to try to uh, 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 narrow that gap a bit 
as we get clarity on the state budget and other things. And so uh, with that then, uh, in summary, overall, in spite of the dramatic reductions in revenue the district faces, this budget protects, it preserves and sustains the core program. Teacher student ratios, school site budgets, our commitment to our foster English learners and free and reduced students through the LCFF supplemental allocation and our student intervention programs are all maintained. In student services, which is inclusive of our health, social, emotional, and nutrition, are all maintained. And again, that rolls up to your priorities, the board priorities. And uh, for that reason, we uh, recommend positive certification uh, for this budget. And I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have, and I'll stop sharing. Okay, I have uh, Ms. Barto has her hand up. Yes, um, in light of the big changes to the uh, May revise that have come down from the uh, Senate and the House of Representatives, um, the state representatives, um, what, that's a potentially a much better budget for us than what is currently proposed. Do you think that's, I mean, that's like a big question, but do you feel like that's likely to pass because potentially with the deficit, uh, the small deficit in property taxes, the coal is still there, the LCFF, the categoricals are still there. We retain a lot of our ability to serve students without so many cuts. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Well, the legislature uh, has just a much, favor much more favorable budget. We would love that. Historically, though, the governor has the power of the blue pen, uh, the veto pen, and as such, the governor has some uh, sway in how, how that's going to happen. And uh, it remains to be seen how Governor Newsom's going to, to deal with this. I, uh, most people are, uh, would say that, yes, we might see some uh, minor changes, but wholesale changes are probably unlikely. Uh, at least that's how it's been historically. Thank you. Um, Jeff, I have one question and it's, and it's not in the budget, but um, this is the census year and now the requirements are to, to realign trustee areas after the census. So in the year 2021, which will be next year, we will have some expenses incurred in terms of, of, of looking at uh, a realignment again, because that's what we're required to do now, uh, based on our agreements and based on everything. So have you, that's one question is, that's not, that's, there's nothing in the budget about that, um, that we may have to, that has to be added on. Um, and the second question is, um, it's in line with what um, Michelle just asked, is that based on some of the guidelines, the CDC guidelines um, and the Department of, Ed, you know, and we don't know, you know, what, what, what our recommendations in, in terms of what uh, Russell just talked about in terms of uh, reopenings, there could be, in fact, increased costs i.e. in transportation um, and, and in maintenance and in, in operations relative to those items. For example, I mean, you know, off the top is that the CDC is recommending that smaller class sizes, six, you know, and going into, it, it, you know, social distancing in, in, in even in corridors. Um, so there may be additional signage that may be needed. There may be additional bus routes because uh, we transport a number of students. Uh, um, we can't eliminate busing. I mean, for example, Adams Elementary School, uh, you know, the proposal is from members of the community to send them back to their neighborhood schools. Well, um, the Joanne Rectangle, the neighborhood school is Adams. That means that they have to be transported. Um, and if not, you're bordering on segregation if you keep talking about that because we have students that are, that are bused because their neighborhood school is not within walking distance, and we have certain parameters in terms of walking. Um, so are so we- A lot changed on that though. Not, not us, Ashley. We are still required by OCR. We are under decree. No, Ashley, you're, not, you're incorrect on that. We, we are in that forever. Um, 
So the question is, have you fig is that going to be figured in? Are we are we putting a percentage or just something about about some of these these potential costs as it relates to reopening? Yes, we um, uh, it, it is going to be very expensive. Um, so far, I just looked a few minutes ago. We have spent three point three million dollars on COVID related kinds of expenditures, and in our uh, budget, we have. In fact, study session, uh, we showed that we scored $2.3 million um, for kind of COVID related kinds of things. And so there is a, um, um, how you say, a, a, a plan to handle some, some more uh, higher expenditures out there. Okay. But you're right, it, it's nobody knows the, 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 the uh, we just don't know at this point, but we think you're in a good, place in terms of we have reserves, you have reserves, we've budgeted for some COVID uh, kinds of things in uh, 2021, so we think you're in a good place to handle it. Okay, and I'm going to, um, Ms. Black doesn't have her hand up, but I'm, I'm, I'm going to call on her because I know that she's going to have a comment about <laughs> accessing bond measure F funds um, that are still sitting there or technology. So I'm going to let you go over to you, Ms. Black, because I know I know you're itching to say something about it. <laughs> well, and I and I am really appreciative, um, you know, with um, actually with all the work that you've done because you've been a part of this team, you know, Jeff, and um, and we wouldn't have a triple um, A credit rating and and the you know actually. Um, you know, it's such a positive influence in the financial world out there. You know, we, we do live in the fifth largest um, economy in the world. And, and I believe Newport Mesa is doing that and making sure that we're as far away, you know, from cuts and whatnot. So I know that this is, this is really a lot of time and energy. And I, but I also want to know, because of technology, this is something that's been weighing heavy on me, you know, since um, the new state standards, because everything's embedded with technology. And, um, and I had the opportunity of, of, you know, interacting for a year and a half with Tustin Unified, and they did pass a bond strictly for technology. <clears throat> and um, I just wonder, you know, because it's going to be very draining you know, for us as things go on. It's not gonna get easier or cheaper. It's just gonna be more demanding. So um, I know we have approximately 28 million left or what do we have left in our Measure F fund? Well, um, are you talking about what we have left in terms of authorization or? Well, I know authorization, we've pretty much spoken for it, haven't we? Well, there's for about $80 million left for in an authorization. Oh, goody, because I was, <laughs> I was right, Martha. But anyway, I was wondering what your thoughts would be about going out to a bond, because I know with the, you know, the crisis, and we benefited greatly during the Great Recession. I mean, you know, we were paying 50 cents on the dollar for construction, and, um, and it was a silver lining with something that was so traumatic for, you know, our community, well, for, you know, the United States actually in general, but for, um, for doing something in the technology um, realm, is it something that you think would be feasible to sell a bond, uh, be able to put together, you know, uh, I mean, I kind of know what I would like to go, but, <laughs> um, but what, what's your thoughts on it? I mean, I know you know, because I've been dogging you about this, you know, through emails and whatnot, but um, what are your thoughts about that? Well, it's interesting because, um, uh, and, and if I'm thinking, you tell me if I'm thinking right, but for peripherals and, and uh, those kinds of things, they, they have about a five-year life. Right. And so we always try to match, um, you know, if we're going to do uh, a bond, it's usually 30 years, but we're matching it to five-year uh, kinds of uh, life for these peripherals. Mm -hmm. that I don't know if that's really going to be a good match for that kind of thing. There may be some other ways that we could take care of that. I think one of the things maybe uh, Mr. Lee Sung would like to, to address this is, is you know, where, where we do want to go and, 
And if, if there is that kind of um, vision, then we'll figure it out from the finance side, how mm -hmm. to make that happen. Well, I think that the way the technology is, you know, um, moving forward at the speed of light, um, you know, I think use, utilizing other districts have utilized the cloud and, and have had tremendous savings where you're not having to replace units. You're not having to, you know, repair units and constantly, you know, um, well, just, just being honest so that students have them 24, you know, seven basically. So, but, but they have come up with some pretty dynamic ways that actually cut costs and you can utilize the Chromebook, but you bring in a monitor, utilize the, you know, a uh, keyboard, and I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Bartow to help me with this, but, um, but using monitors and replacing those are a lot cheaper than doing laptops across the board. And, and also in our um, CTE advisory, we had um, our industry talking about how they saved millions upon millions of dollars doing these types of <clears throat> retrofitting, if you will, and, and utilizing their staff that's currently fixing computers, you know, the towers and laptops and replacing them. Now they have, you know, really saved millions of dollars by, you know, um, using, you know, keyboards, mouse, you know, and monitors. And, and still, you know, the $150 you know, um, you know, computers that we're using for our kids, you know, across the district and even teachers could because it's just a mechanism. So it really, you know, actually inspired me more after listening to the different industry. And I just, you know, I just want us to be, you know, when we're looking at all of this, I'd like to see us move in that direction, you know, if we can. I mean, I know, <laughs> I know you know, <laughs> but um, it's just I, we're always in crisis mode for the last couple of years, and and I just think that this would be you know instead of cutting things, I think we could be moving in a more efficient way. So, okay, um, thanks for Miss uh, uh, Miss Anderson, and then Miss uh, then Miss Matoye. I think Char had her hand up first, so she can go first. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, just to clarify, we may have $80 million of Measure F money that we have not used up yet, mm -hmm. but, yeah. we can't, but we can't access that money under the current constraints of Measure F that says we can't raise the amount of contribution home prop in our property taxes that are billed to us at the measure a level so we would have to take if i'm wrong stop me somebody we'd have to take it to the voters to say hi are you willing to pay a little more per month so that we can access the money you said we could access because we can't just say yes lose the money we am i right mr trader oh, i think dana's talking about a new bond but i agree i wanted to know what the answer was on that no no i'm 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 actually believing that we are positioned to probably be able to like we did um, for Estancia um, Theater. I think that, re, you know, uh, the economy, refinance. well, the bond market is oh. very strong and our interest rates are very low and it would be worth investigating. So to see whether or not a bond sale, not, I don't want to go out to the voters because that costs us more money. Exactly. <laughs> and I so, know, I agree. You, but I didn't yeah, but it would be down the road, you know, for future boards, it would be to their benefit, you know, to maybe go out because technology is not, I mean, never who knows stop. where it's going to go, but it is critical for our kids to be competitive, I believe. It's critical for this person to do her business, and I struggle every day because, um, you know, I'm having to learn as I go. You know, and, and with a busy schedule, I don't have time to sit, you know, and, um, and learn it. So for our children, so that they can help their grandparents in the future, we need them to learn <laughs> the cutting edge technology. And I am being somewhat facetious, but I want you to know, I believe it's true. You know, I believe that this is what we're going to do. So, no, I, I believe that we, it may be an opportunity at, in this, you know, financial 
time that this may not be a bad time to at least investigate it and see. Because I know we have to we have to sell them when it's eighteen dollar, a little over eighteen dollars per hundred thousand of its best value, and I believe that um, we may be in that position right now. I could be wrong. That would be wonderful. Can you? Uh, I'll check with our financial advisor and, and get back to you on that. Okay. Right, well, I appreciate that. At least, I, at least, I'll, at least we look into it. I'm I'm not necessarily suggesting a new bond at this point. But no, but road, if we, we can access. If we can access our own money, that's great. I just didn't want people to think we had $80 million in a bank account that we're not touching. Because if it was there, we'd be touching all over it. So, yeah, right. thank you. We just can't access it. Exactly. We just want to figure out how to refinance it again. Uh, Ms. Yeah. Anderson. Um, yeah, mine um, kind of goes along with different options, but I'm, I was wondering, um, we have had Steve from the Banning Ranch Conservancy come a few times to the board meetings. And it seems like now could be a time to sell that property and turn it into, give it to them so they can turn it into a park or a wildlife space. And so we wouldn't, as Dana said, continue to be in crisis. It could make sense rather than right now it's collecting rusted lockers on it and other debris when it could be a beautiful space that then like even students could walk to and use as a nature site. Have we considered that as an option? I know in the past when there are financial difficulties or concerns, extra property was sold and it seems like that could be one that this would be useful in this time to consider. Have we had any, well, I, the I just one that I heard from Steve was he had emailed Mr. Holcomb and not gotten a response. So I didn't know if that was due to a lack of direction or it, I just, I feel like we should return people's emails. And so I have, that's when I have not received an email from Steve. Okay. I, I, just want to say, I just want to say that selling property, uh, district owned property is a very big deal. And mm -hmm. uh, that is something that um, we need to be discussing uh, with the, the proper people uh, present and have it be agendized and appropriately and all of that. But to um, just talk about selling property to address this budget crisis that we have to deal with right yeah. now uh, isn't really a viable solution, but certainly that's something that we can discuss with the board at an appropriate time on an appropriate agenda item. But that- and it will need to be a closed session item. I, yeah, I mean, for me, I think year. one reason why I think it is viable to be discussed and I think for us to do it in close, I know we need to do that, but if there is another recession, if there's something that happens, if next year COVID is worse, I mean, we don't know what the next two years will bring. And so I, I would like for us to put it on the agenda to discuss and close. And I think it would be really important um, for you in particular to understand <clears throat> just what um, Russell said, because those are one of the things that I thought, you know, we can't build on it. Um, and it's also, you know, um, you know, earthquake. I mean, we could, but it's also near the Inglewood Newport Fault. <clears throat> and that just, you know, they pretty much shot you down and we need to protect the taxpayers' assets, you know, along with our budget. And so we got to make sure that we get the highest and best use of it. But we also are obligated to go out to municipalities, cities, and offer it to government, which means we sell it for a lot less. It's you know, we don't go during an emergency. If no, and that, and that doesn't cover all the ills. You still have to go through. You still have to go through the restrictions um, in order to make sure that you you don't come back and leave money on the table. That's my layperson way of saying it. But it's you know you want to make sure. And so I agree. I think it's good that you learn as much as you can about it because in the future it may it may be something that you have to you know go back to at that point. I, I think we need to do a little bit of education um Ashley yes we did sell Bear Street School but we received a where we have to offer it to the Naylor Act and the Naylor Act is it has to be declared and we have to do it. We got special it was S B double X that was sponsored by Ross Johnson back in the day that allowed us to sell the Bear Street 
school property and use it for general fund because any pro any funds that we sell any property we sell is restricted to specific uses and cannot be used in for the general fund and we were allowed we got a special one time one time senate passed bill to sell that property and it was during the bankruptcy that we were able to sell the bear street property other than that the property we have sold all fell through the nailer act declaring it uh declaring it uh vacant and then opening it up to bids in the bear street school we had uh three or four bids that we had to open up in public um but, but before that we had to open it and it was subject to the nailer act and the city um any of the sites we sold property we sold the um actually the farm costa mesa farm was a nailer act it was purchased by the city of costa mesa and at a, a significant we um, it Jeez. was valued at over $10 million and we sold it for less than, I think, $2 million. Is that correct, Dana? It was a significant for less than what? Um, how much did we sell the, 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 it was given to the city of, basically it was sold to the city of Costa Mesa. Yeah, at a it, it's a lot lower. It was, I don't think it was that low, but it was a lot lower than that. Yeah, so. Okay, well, I'm, I'm just asking if we can put it on a closed session to learn more about it, if it's feasible. I understand there are some strong feelings, I, as a board member, have asked a few times, and we had one small talk about it in close. I would like to discuss it again. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Okay. Any other, um, Ms. Matoya? Did you you had your hand up? Again. You're on mute. You're on mute. My finger wasn't working. Um, <laughs> I blurted out instead of waiting my turn. So thank you. You can. <clears throat> Put my hand down. Thank you. Okay. Um, any further questions? Okay. So um, I'm you officially closing the public hearing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to know what you're doing. Uh, so uh, on June 23rd, um, we will be presented uh, with um, the adoption of the budget. Oh, I do. I do have a question. Okay. Should, I don't know, the, the district can't buy a lottery ticket, but should the budget from the governor, from the state of California, all of a sudden something turns around, we get all this influx of money, or it comes in in October, or in the course of it, we can reinstate certain things. We can bring things back if we get an influx of giant amounts of money. Am I correct? So if the circumstances changes, obviously we can make adjustments. Uh, we need to analyze and, and determine what our needs are. I, I don't want to commit to uh, certain things. We could things. also change because we don't yeah, know Yeah, because, you know, we might get more money here, but our needs are greater in another area. And again, I think we appreciate the short-term um, uh, ability to respond without uh, moving to layoffs or anything very severe. Uh, that's kudos to uh, this board and to Jeff Trader's uh, work, uh, but, but that, that's how we would do it. And as Jeff said, uh, first interim, uh, we will know a lot more. Within a couple of months, we will know a lot more. So- Because we uh, don't even know what we know. Right now, we know that we don't know what we need. Yeah, Jeff uh, has called it in prior presentations, and I use this a lot, known unknowns. Yeah, exactly. Again, uh, Perfect. Thank you, Jeff, for all of your work. I think, uh, I mean, the key points are we're maintaining class size, we're maintaining instructional program, we're, we, are maintain, we are not going to layoffs, um, and those are all really positive, positive things. Um, that's right. And that's, and, and with the, with the mind of the, of all of our priorities and the health and safety and the emotional growth part. So thank you. Uh, moving on to discussion action item. I know John Drake has been waiting patiently for this exciting moment. So uh, 
requiring the approval of the illustrative mathematics as the instructional math materials for Algebra 1, Al Geometry, and Algebra 2. Take it away, John. Right, I'm going to make a motion. I'm going to make a motion oh. to approve. Second. OK. OK, Ms. take it away, now John. Ms. Matoyer, uh, Ms. Black set, ma made the motion. Ms. Matoyer seconded. John, go ahead. All right. Well, President Fleur, board members, thank you for the opportunity. As you recall, we spent uh, over an hour at the May 19th board meeting uh, walking you through the year-long process that our high school math teachers engaged in um, to identify illustrative mathematics materials as a set of materials that would um, uh, fulfill the promise, at least in materials, of a K-12 experience uh, for kids in mathematics. Um, and so at that point, we asked for um, approval to put it up for public display. Uh, we have done that. Uh, the last documented preview of the public was uh, or is June 1st. Um, we will keep it up, um, you know, for people to see. It's been publicized on all of our websites at, at sites um, and was blasted out in several different ways with the NET's um, support. Um, and so I am really excited to be in front of you tonight asking for you to approve the adoption of illustrative math materials after the uh, year-long teacher-centered process and identifying these as the materials they'd like to move forward with in their classrooms. Any questions? Comments? I, I, still, um, I would still like to see us have some conversation about um, the financial, the approved program which is the, the financial algebra that's been adopted that's an A through G uh, for those students that are not, um, that are struggling um, and it's been adopted by, uh, by um, uh, Kappa Unified um, for those students that are not necessarily uh, moving on but need, need some of that support but are not taking, are not prepared to, to, to deal with algebra two. So I, I hope that we would take a look at something. It would be, a replacement of more uh, more stringent um, uh, business math, but it's an A through G requirement, so it would it would satisfy our uh, our necessity for having um, A through G approved courses. So I hope we would we would consider something like that for the kids that are um, not college bound but are going into the world of work or going into a certificate program. So I'm hoping that we would we would take a look at that one. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, it's been moved and seconded. Roll call, please. Wait a minute, Martha. Yes. Yeah. I wanted to say thank you for the process. I really appreciate that you went, you listened to the teachers and you went back and you did a full year. And I think that really helped get everyone to really understand what they were saying yes to. So thank you for putting in all of that work and for listening to the teachers. Absolutely. Perfect. My pleasure. Any further comments? Okay, uh, roll call, please. Ms. Floor? Yes. Ms. Yelsey? Yes. Ms. Black? Yes. Ms. Bartow? Yes. Ms. Anderson? Yes. Ms. Snell? Absent. Ms. Matoye? Yes. Um, so board members, I really beg your forgiveness, but you know when you can't see a, the screen and you don't have the agenda on, I completely forgot about a, a very important part of our our, uh, our, <laughs> our group, and that is completely skipped over item number, uh, let's see, oh, 15 informal reports by our, illust our cabinet members. And so I, I apologize, but I'm putting them in now. So uh, uh, yeah. I'm going to give you, Dr. Uh, Mr. Lee Sung, uh, superintendent, and then we'll move on from there. Thank you. We would not have let you get away this evening. <laughs> Giving uh, our formal reports, okay? So I have that on my notes. So um, this is the perfect uh, with this approval of the uh, Lester of Math materials that uh, you remember a few months ago, I, I, I'm trying to coin the phrase of relish the moment. And this is one of those relish the moments moments uh, to take us back not too long ago when we as a district um, embarked on uh, seeking high quality materials in math. 
And Mr. Drake um, led the effort in our district and painted, <laughs> vision, painted a vision that it would be a seamless uh, TK-12 math experience. And you heard him say that. And we've heard him say it in all the meetings where he was standing in front of uh, teachers and administrators and us um, that that was the vision. And so with your full support uh, and approving these materials, uh, that has come to fruition. He will tell you, he's the first one to say there's so much more work to do, but to have a math uh, program that is seamless through our district is a relish the moment moment. So kudos to Mr. Drake, kudos to the board for your support, kudos to all and administrators and district administrators and the support of our, our associations to make this happen. This, this is definitely a relish the moment moment. Great. And it's also high level rigorous math. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So is that, is that the end of your report? <laughs> That's the end of my report <laughs> for tonight. Okay, so we're moving down to Leona. Good evening, everyone. Um, First, let me just echo Russell's sentiment about um, the math adoption. I am a math teacher, and um, I'm, while I'm in the HR world, I am definitely, I can never leave the curriculum and the instructional world, thank goodness, um, and I just really appreciate it, and what a feat it is to bring everyone together for that the, a program of um, just continuum growth, continual growth. Um, and just congratulations to John and his team. Um, I also would like to recognize some people. Uh, at the last board meeting, I did mention our JBT when I was talking about our wellness for staff. And um, I wanna talk about them a little bit more today. So our, our, our joints benefit team is responsible to monitor the utilization of our plans and to really learn about how a medical plan works, what drives health um, and welfare benefit costs, and to review the plans. And so our, so the team, and I'm going to name them, so we have our CSEA reps. We have Pam Saunders, Stu Tedford, Sean Katz, Amy Gonzalez, and Lynn Aldridge. We have our NMFT reps. We've got Britt Dowdy. We have Nicholas Dix, Jamie Ropp, Kathy Adamak. And representing management is Todd Hatfield, Patrick Bullock, Kathleen Hedges, and myself. And Vicki Wyman, our budget supervisor, also is in attendance and um, brings information forward to the group. So this past year, anticipating um, high increase of costs of possibly up to 20% in our Cigna plan, the team really took a deep, long look into our into the utilization and into the plan design and we had some very difficult conversations because we know how important health and welfare benefits are to our employees and so we had to put all of our biases aside we just had to look into the plans and and because of that great work and that collective work uh, folks will be seeing a joint communique coming out soon from from the team um, where we will share the changes that we've had to make in plan design, and they were very thoughtfully made uh, and recommended. But the, when we were expecting such a high increase, and it would have happened if we hadn't made some changes, we now have it down um, to much lower, um, about 2.67%. So I just really want to congratulate the team. It's just been an absolute pleasure to be a part of and to have the conversations with them. So thank you to all of them. It took many, many meetings um, in the middle of all of this. Most of them Zoom, I might add, like since April. Great. Thank you so much, Leona. Uh, moving down to uh, Mr. Holcomb. Thank you, Mrs. Floor. Well, as, as we've all talked about a number of times uh, since the coronavirus uh, came to us, um, everything uh, in the future will be somewhat different. And uh, one of the areas that clearly will be different is our technology and, and how we handle technology. Uh, our district was very uh, focused on desktops and on how to 
provide technology support in the classroom. We were not set up to be a remote work uh, from home like a uh, tech company. And so as we looked at the, <clears throat> pardon me, as we've looked through this and we looked at the uh, uh, refreshes of teacher uh, desk, desktops, teacher workstations, it became clear to us that uh, the world would never be the same again, that uh, coronavirus could uh, have a resurgence and force us into a difficult place and that we needed to go um, in a different direction. So um, we really appreciate uh, the board a couple of meetings ago approving the uh, purchase of computers, the purchase order to purchase the computers. They are purchased. We have 450 right now. We will get another 450 in a few weeks. And uh, we will be able, because of that, uh, and, and a few more that will come even after that, to roll out uh, uh, a laptop as the primary uh, computer for all of our certificated staff across the district, uh, which will allow us to have flexibility uh, if uh, we need it in the future uh, so that we can do remote learning in a much better way. And it will also allow us to uh, provide good tech support by having uh, common systems across uh, all of our uh, classrooms so that um, and rather than having it refreshed by zones, uh, this way we're making sure that we're hitting uh, every uh, teaching station uh, so that everybody has uh, equivalent technology because we found that uh, having little bits of different things actually uh, was as much a burden uh, as it would have been and, and, that, and dealing with um, each one separately, this is much easier to deal with the entire cohort. And we're really pleased that it's gonna provide uh, good teaching tools for our, our teachers and um, good ability to, to obtain good instruction for our students. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Trader, do you have anything else to add? Yeah, go ahead, Ashley. Um, have we communicated that out to our certificated staff? I had seen in the past month several that had donors choose to have a laptop purchase. So I want to make sure that we're communicating that so teachers don't spend their summer trying to raise funds. We, we will definitely communicate that to them. This is uh, very good news. Um, we did communicate this with to our associations and to our principals and with this announcement, we will then be communicating to all of them. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Trader. I just wanted to take a moment to thank the board for your patience. This has been, um, a, a, you know, figure, trying to figure out how to run the district from home and then with all the uncertainty around the budget, those kinds of things, thank you for your patience and helping me to understand what's gonna be helpful for you. So I look forward to bringing you uh, an update here very quickly on um, what we discussed uh, uh, tonight and, and appreciate your communicating that to me. Um, just one other thing, I just wanted to let you know that uh, uh, the warehouse is really pushing out a lot of uh, cleaning kinds of equipment and supplies out to the sites so that uh, we'll be prepared to keep those sites uh, spick and span. Thank you so much. Great. Um, uh, Dr. Sir. Thank you, President Floor, Vice President Yelsey, board members, uh, Mr. Lee Sung, and uh, the community. I wanted to give you an update in regards to uh, element at the elementary level, our end of year closing activities. Um, it is that time of year when we're right in the throes of uh, closing things down and also planning for next year. So it's one of those uh, challenging times in the year when you have uh, numerous things happening all at once. In regards to closing down for the year and closing our classrooms, um, uh, I think that Dr. Dowdy said it really well in regards to the importance of collective effort and what a great impact it can have when we have our classified employees and our certificated employees all working together to help one another out and uh, work on some pretty big things. And when it comes to closing out the year, specifically, we're talking about closing our classrooms. And um, starting yesterday, going all the way through this week and all the way through next week, we have uh, teachers um, returning, 
we have uh, classified employees returning to close classrooms down. Uh, every school has a, a tradition, a checklist, a different process to go through that process of closing down the school for the year. But uh, we did have to do some collective work in order to make that happen. We do have employees that are in the high risk group and uh, we have uh, people that are filling in. We have classified employees that have been amazing with helping us in the classrooms. We have uh, uh, certificated employees that are helping one another out. And it's, uh, it's just been great to see everybody uh, working together. Um, there is a lot to do. And uh, over the course of the next two weeks, uh, part of the process of closing out our classrooms is about returning student belongings and returning student. That's, that's artwork, that's awards for the year, that could be portfolios, just so many different things that we have to get back to the families. And if you remember, the, the good thing is that we do have some processes that are, that are helpful to us. Like when we returned the, when we provided the student consumable materials, that was a good process that we had that we could turn to, to replicate again, because when it comes to student materials being returned, not all uh, classrooms and schools are created equally, if you will. We have, um, uh, and we have a couple options for schools. One option is that if everything can fit into a large envelope, we are doing a mailing process of all of the things that students will receive for the year, all of their personal belongings. When we put out the student consumables a few weeks ago, the only, con the only personal belongings that we returned were readily available student belongings. So this is comprehensive in that we are returning everything to our students. So uh, the first option again is uh, putting everything into an oversized envelope and uh, mailing those out. And the second option for schools is that if you have more stuff that needs to be returned to our students that will not fit in a large envelope, we are going to be going through a pack-up process and a pickup process just like we did for the uh, student consumable materials uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, so this week, if uh, the schools are, are going to go through that process of pack up and pick up, this is the week that we're focused on doing the pack up. And uh, next week is the week that we have scheduled distributions. And again, our end goal in all of this is to truly close our classrooms by the 19th, by Friday, the last day of school. And I just uh, appreciate so many people, far too many to acknowledge in this process, but it certainly is a, a collect, collective effort as Dr. Dowdy had mentioned. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Drake. Thank you, President Fleur. Um, I'd like to give you a, a update on where we are with um, uh, supporting our elementary students uh, through the summer. Um, uh, as a collective team in Ed Services, working really closely with principals over the last couple of weeks, um, we decided to take a two-pronged approach, one for all students, and then um, also build some time uh, for some targeted uh, uh, most needy students. Um, uh, we're working currently with TOSAs to develop um, uh, and compile digital resources uh, and modules for them to use throughout the summer. That'll be part of our digital um, toolkit that Janet's department has um, beautifully put together really through this whole process. Um, and we'll communicate that out to families as a resource for them and support them in, in using that. Um, the, the other part of it is um, we will also spend time identifying our most needy um, students from our, um, our schools our, our, and target those students um, to be part of a um, a, a centralized uh, two-week um, kind of jumpstart into next year, um, uh, which will focus on language arts and math. Um, some of the factors that we've taken into account in building this, and, and we've heard some things about um, leading with empathy and understanding. Um, one of the messages we hear over and over, and I think you probably do, is that people are tired. Kids are tired. Families are tired, and so we wanted to make sure that we were taking all of those things into account um, as we target these students and bring them back a little more refreshed um, towards the latter part of the summer. Um, that also gives us time to work with um, human resources to make sure that we are um, uh, able to uh, staff with our best and brightest teachers after they've had uh, a little bit of time uh, to also unwind um, and recharge. So our plans are moving forward um, to support that. 
uh, and also communicate uh, to, to the families of all the supports that will be in place for them for the summer. Great. Uh, Dr. Bauermeister. So from my report, I was going to update you on graduation and promotion and maybe athletics. And we already talked about that. You've heard my voice enough, so I will pass to someone else. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jockham. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, uh, as you know, I like to be the bearer of good news when I come and present to uh, my board update. So I have a couple things for you. One is that tomorrow evening is our uh, parent education uh, virtual Zoom meeting. It's uh, the title is Countdown to Summer. It's from 6 to 7.30. The information is on our district website, but we're excited. We have uh, Dr. Lerner, who is a physician consultant with the district, and he's going to be talking about uh, having a safe and healthy summer. We have Heather Krikorian and uh, Amy Becker, who are the behavior specialist that we hired, and they're going to be talking about summer activities and developing healthy routines around the home in the summertime. And then we have Sarah Coley and Angela Castellanos, and they're going to talk about how to stay connected to the district over the summer. And then um, there's going to be a time of Q&A afterwards, and we definitely have um, Javier, who is, is uh, doing our translation. Spanish translation is available. So it was a, a great um, parent education last time. We're, we're looking forward to doing this one again, and hopefully it will be as successful. And then the second thing that Phil alluded to in a, part of his presentation was the care and support line that the district um, has had up and running. And so I have some data for you just between April 20th through May 29th. And there were over 1,100 calls into the care and concern line. And as you know, they had six different options. And uh, the, the first, and um, uh, no surprise here, most popular option was uh, IT support. And there was over 600 calls there for IT student support, Chromebooks, hotspots. Um, and then uh, we had 120 calls to nutrition services, finding out where to get meals, how to get, um, uh, you know, the, a lot of our families felt they had to prove free and reduced lunch in order to get a free internet. So there was lots of questions about that. There were 40 questions uh, for the distance learning portion, um, how to get on Zoom, how to access certain assignments. Um, we had 106 calls to our mental health services um, with families who were concerned about their students' um, wellness and families who've lost jobs and just uh, needed some support from uh, district folks. We had 75 calls to student records about uh, transcripts, work permits, record changes, questions about enrollment. And then we had uh, about 200 calls that were just other. And they were, um, most of those were uh, kind of sent back to their individual school sites. But um, overall, it's been a very successful, I think it's been a very useful uh, tool for folks to access. And uh, I know Phil talked about what we're going to be able to continue to do during the summer if we, maybe we need to change some of the options or, or look at those things. So we're going to be doing that. But um, I think it's been very successful. And again, that was a good collaborative effort with um, with IT and then all of the different divisions, uh, you know, food services and ed division and student services in terms of um, all of the people who are manning those calls. So that's all I have tonight. Terrific. Okay. Um, in light of the hour, I'm sure that you all would like to finish. Um, I know Charlene, you have your hand up, but let me finish and see whether this will satisfy is I know um, a couple of you have submitted your reports. In light of the hour, would it be a can? Can is there anything desperate that anybody says, or can we? Uh, can you send it to us in an email, and I'll make sure that Cherry sends it all out together. Um, uh, if you have a report, that would be wonderful. I know Shar, thank you. You you made all our right. report. Michelle, you have. Um, I have a brief report on on crop, and Michelle, you have a legislative. But if we could just combine those all and send them out. Um, and 
get them out. And if you have anything to personally report on, um, now is the time, but I, it's really short, it really um, the long been a long meeting. And so if that's- I okay, just have a quick you, question. What? Quick question to Dr. Jockin. Yes. Um, I've got another I, one from Ashley. Go I ahead. have a mental health task force meeting on my calendar for tomorrow at 2 p.m. Is it still happening? I have no idea. Uh, Dr. D'Agostino, is that still happening? Yes, that mental health task force meeting is still happening. Thank you. That was my whole question. Okay, and Ms. Anderson? Um, yeah, I have two things. Um, I was just wondering about the summer school item. Um, thank you for sharing, John. Um, I have been getting calls and emails every day from parents that are in Area 7 asking, begging for summer school for their children. So I'm a little concerned because I, I hear that we're thinking about it now, which I think is great, but several of them specifically ask for the morning from at least like 9 to 12 to get their kids if possible, and particularly because the schools are opening up to have some kind of face-to-face -face because so much was lost without them being able to have a direct in-person um, instruction for elementary particularly. So I just, I'm wondering if there's any way we can do a cert, we love surveys, I love surveys, they're great. Is there a way that we could send a survey out from the, from the principals to the parents? Because I think what I'm hearing is we're kind of making some assumptions, like the teachers are tired, the students are tired, but that's not necessarily the parents are saying, my child needs more academically and I want them to have something for the summer. So I'm just wondering if we can do a, a more proactive step and really ask the parents what their needs are. Not so, just for reopening, but for summer. So Russell, can you provide us some information and probably Leona as well? Um, I know that in the past we've had difficulty staffing from a staff point of view. We've had, you know, when we've had our programs Traditionally, we've had even difficult time. We've had to go out and hire uh, teachers from outside the district. So could you get us uh, just, uh, you know, in terms of survey of what, whether we have even teachers that are willing to, to, to do so? I mean, if you could just get that to us, that would be really helpful. Yeah, right. I think, yeah. Asking Please. the teachers and the parents, I think we just need more information. I, I just don't want us to make assumptions and not ask directly. Well, it, that's exactly what we are. We are pursuing this program. Uh, I believe we are going to have teachers who will rise to the occasion and want to do this work. Uh, and, and I don't want that to be a reason why we're not offering it, which is why Mr. Drake uh, indicated what we plan to do. What's interesting is your comment about in person. And I just want to let you know, again, you know, it's uncertain whether we can do one in person or not. So we, what Mr. Drake said, that it would be, um, you know, distance learning, but we agree. And based on the feedback we've received so far, if we could do this in person, that would be our first choice. And I'm, I'm thinking of it a little, little uh, differently as well, is could this also be kind of a, a bit of a, a trial run on a small case yeah. basis for the opening in the fall? So we, we've had those discussions. We can't commit to that, uh, but we are discussing that as a, as a possibility. Okay, great, thank you. And then I am, the last thing was, I was wondering if during the summer, at least one time, we can reconvene the Human Relations Task Force in light of everything that has been going on nationally. Um, I think that that would be really important to Kind of reassess what are some things that came up across the nation that are still things that possibly we need to address as a district what are some things that are positive <laughs> that happened um and so i was just wondering if we can get at least one date on the calendar perhaps one like one in the end of june one in july one in august that would be even better okay. and i just wanted to commend christy flores wrote an amazing um, email out to her school community and like three people sent it to me and if any of you ha if you haven't seen it it's it's super well written and it just is really a wonderful 
I, we don't have time. I was going to read it, but she just did a phenomenal job. So please, if you see her, tell her thank you. Great. Thank you. And I don't know whether many of you know, but uh, the Newport Harbor Foundation, we have 80 students who are putting together a book of memories and they have written poems and stories about, uh, about their COVID experience. And uh, they, are, they are selling it. And also um, um, you can donate to a, class, uh, a, class, uh, a classroom set so that they can have a, be part of the curriculum. So it's kind of exciting that we've got 80 students at Newport Harbor um, that are doing a reflections on their COVID experience. So it's gonna be published, so that's great. Um, so if we can just uh, can I have a motion to adjourn, we'll, uh, you're going to get us information on, on I want to get my oh, um, Michelle, I'm sorry. Okay. Um, so it, uh, it'll be short. Um, you guys will all see the survey. You've seen the survey that came through and I've spent the majority of my week, uh, talking to, among other things, parents regarding sports. Um, as you know, that email that came out last week pr prompted a, a flurry of concern. Um, but what I wanted to honor is the fact that the um, CDM uh, football booster Scott Brown and Jason Levin at Newport Harbor put the time and effort into taking, uh, creating a parent survey and coming up with recommendations. Whether or not we can follow those recommendations, they were very creative. And they surveyed 831 sports parents and got a 90, about 95 response rate uh, to an interest of returning in sports without, um, with, you know, right now, and about an 88% of returning to strength training. So they have some requests, but July 1st start date, which doesn't sound like we'll be able to accommodate, um, you know, establish, what I thought was a good idea was establishing kind of a, a threshold of what, when we would like move back from sports. We've talked about that so much with education, but it's not something that has been on my radar as something to think about for sports. And I, uh, I kind of looked at the guidelines. I didn't see that in there either. So something we'll want to look at ourselves yeah. and then, so so Russell, I think it's going to be really important that um, that become, you know, a, you know, another priority. But it's it's a really short term. It's a quick priority that we need to we need to address this um, soon. Um, Wait, so those are, those are the main things I heard, and you guys can read the email. But those are the the main. Yeah, those, and, and and again, the 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 Corona del Mar uh, water polo as well as the Costa Mesa water polo, they have both sent submitted um, very detailed plans, and I commend them. And they've been forwarded to you all also at the district um, in terms of how they plan on on doing the protocols. And so I think that we really need to address um, this issue really quickly um, because. You know, given the fact that Dr. Bauermeister said we can't do anything until July 6th, okay, well, you know, or whatever that date is, we'd like, I'd like to be able to um, communicate with our, our, our families um, throughout the district of what, what our plans are and uh, the abilities to, whether we're going to be offering and allowing even some of our sports team, not even our sports teams, AYSO, uh, you know, kids activities, rocks program, whatever they are. Uh, because we know that we got from the we got it from the, uh, the the Laura Detweiler that they offer you know Costa Mesa offers after school pro you know during summer programs and so does the city of of Newport Beach and they have used our facilities and they are wanting to know whether we're going to be able to open our programs for them so we need to this is you know summer is really critical right now because parents are desperate. So, um, okay. so agreed can... uh, message delivered and received <laughs> uh, as you know me as you know me I am very deliberate and looking at all the factors and when uh, when we're ready we will present a very thought well thought out plan which will get the job done but I, I, I hear the request and the urgency great thank you so if the board members can um, and then send please send to Russell um, uh, well, Sherry will work with Russell to get out a, um, a survey to out which is the best day for all of us um, for next week. And Russell, do you have an about a t about the number the hours that we're looking at that you'd like us to block out? Uh, probably uh, two hours. Okay. All yeah, right. we'll, have, we'll we'll look for so a two basically hours. three hours is what you're saying. <laughs> okay. Morning or afternoon. 
uh, depends which day it is. We're going to work around the uh, uh, promotions, graduations, and I forget there was one morning that was an issue. But, but we'll, we'll send that out through the superintendent's okay. office. We'll get that on the books early and we'll post the agenda early so that people have time to make comments. And just one thing that Tara didn't mention, uh, step graduation is this coming, um, it's through a Zoom, it's through Zoom and it's on the 11th. So, Oops. and I'll be accepting that and having a saying a few remarks on that. So, all right, everyone. Thank you. Meeting adjourned. Woo.